You know, since we're having this conversation, I can tell you that fully consensual, emotionally driven, not-for-profit podcasting has been attained. You know, <laughs> I just, every time, I just never know. I'm sorry that I smile at the accent. I give you a smile. I feel like the Johnny Lee Miller one's particularly tough to do. Sure. Because he's also the only one who is not natively Scottish. And he's kind of doing a posh, posher right. guy. Yes. Will I be happy to be over with yeah, to be our most with British miniseries? You got one more in you, I think. You I got just, one. You got to do yesterday got one and more. that's it. Yeah. Yes. That's kind of a funny line. Yeah, it's a funny line. I was trying to find a tagline for this movie, but uh didn't have one. Tagline was, was like, they're we, back. We did it. Yeah. Can you guys stop asking us? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, Griffin, I'm kind of upset because I <laughs> oh, feel boy. like okay. you should have done Choose Life and then done... The big monologue, and then at the end, found a way to say, choose your future, choose podcast. Now, I did that for the first train. I did that for the first one. I did the entire thing. Because is this one longer in this movie or shorter? Feels longer. It feels longer, but that might be because it's a little less, like... Yes. It feels like he's getting random at a certain point. And you're like, all right, when's this? By the way, he's not running. Sprague, I thought you yes. would be upset at his bad accent. Well, look, uh, we can't get into <laughs> accents today. Yeah. It's an accent heavy pod. I look, I'm not mad about the accent, but hey, really quick. Hey, David. Mm. Yeah. I, I'm listening to your voice now. I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> something ringing very familiar about it. <laughs> Oh, yeah? What's well, that? Please go right ahead. A lilt? Do you hear a little lilt? Do you hear a, a little, little something like. I feel like, uh, uh, David, uh, tell me what you call a toilet. Uh, what do I, I mean, I don't call it a loo if that's what you're trying to set me up for. I are call you, it a David, toilet. Are you British? <laughs> Look, I was on your podcast and you didn't bring this I up. Forgot, I will because point we were out. so distracted by G- how weird Gigi was. <laughs> yeah, and we were in, right, we were in turn of the century France. We were just, we were transported. Today I'm thinking to myself, this guy's got a little British lilt to him. Look, that's nice of you to say. You I can hear the you in flavor. I would argue. <laughs> <laughs> it's subtle, but you can, you can hear, hear it. me turning those Z's into S's. Oh, I the hear Z. Them. You the say Z instead the of Z's. Z. Yeah. I know. I actually, oh, it, when I lived in England, I really struggled to say Zed. That was one of the ones I could never do. I could never quite mm. say Zed. Yeah. Um, I did I did used to have a lilt spray. I don't think I have a lilt anymore. Mm. I think you you spent some gone. time working it off. Don't worry. In about, in about an hour, I'll work mine off as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe it will. Right. Yeah. Maybe it'll just sort of slowly emerge. We'll still have two hours to go. <laughs> Lil is a soft drink. Yes. Well, Britain. welcome to Scott Hasn't Seen, the podcast that explores the movie Blind Spots. No, no. Welcome Britain. to Sprague Hasn't Seen, the podcast that explores the movie Blind Spots. Okay. Okay. I uh, got to say, Sprague, you were uh, you were saying you were surprised yes. uh, that I didn't do the uh, Choose Life monologue. Right. I have to say, I'm mildly surprised that you are the guest on this episode. <laughs> <laughs> it almost felt like it was a bit of a coin toss who would show up on the Zoom. It's true. And then as, as soon as I started talking, I said to myself, what feels natural? And it was this. <laughs> when you're talking about movies, you're it's talking gone. about Sprague. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. But, to, you know, to the fans of, of, of course, Blank Check, I'll be having a serious conversation about movies. I'm here to dissect. Well, it's important to, that, we, that we got someone from the UK to be on yeah, this well, episode. Absolutely. Look, I'm no movie expert. I will sort of fill the sort of Ben role where if something comes mm. up that I think is gnarly or cool, I'll <laughs> cool. say... That's weird. I'll say, that's yeah. fucking cool. You know, yeah, right, I'll just right. do that. I don't really think of that as being your game, but, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. For this episode, it might be. This episode, it might be. <laughs> Look, this is a No Bits podcast. I think okay. we need to make that okay, very great. clear, yeah. reestablishing Good right up at the top. This is... A no bits podcast, which is why we have two uh, normal human guests today. Uh, this is Blank Check with Griffin and David. It's a podcast about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. And sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce, baby. This is a mini series on the films of Danny Boyle. Yep. What's it's it called, called <clears throat> Train Spodcasting. There you go. Good job. <laughs> or for the sake of today's episode, mm. T2 trains podcasting. Mm. <laughs> worst titles in the history. It of actually this. quietly might be one of the worst titles in the history. Secretly of <laughs> one of the worst titles. For yeah. a movie that I want to say right up front, generally very positive on this movie. I think yes. it's very interesting. Just I just don't know what they were thinking. No, and even just some of the choices of no colon. Every part of it. Not calling it T2 train spotting two. T20, I almost think would be better. No, that, that just drop it. 
what would you call it? Train spotting too. <laughs> I think I appreciate the title because I guess I read somewhere that they were like, this is what the characters would have called the movie. And I thought, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Based on Terminator 2? <laughs> no, just based on how fucking dumb they are, you know? <laughs> T2 train spotting. But like they also they also and I'll I'll tell you this you know they 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 sort of were like oh James Cameron wouldn't like that that's funny yeah that's a weird way <laughs> that is funny it's, it's kind of funny but yeah it'd be funnier if they called it T two Judgment Day Train Spot right. <laughs> <laughs> that would be if they really want to twist the knife in him look our two our two guests today let's get our guests as they here. said yes are the co hosts of the hit podcast the hit movie podcast our fierce rivals. Mm -hmm. Over at Scott Hasn't Seen. Yes. But as you were saying, it's, it's Spring the Western and Scott Ackerman. Hello, guys. Hello, how are you? Thanks for Hi having guys. us on. This is the second part of a doubleheader for yes. us. Scott. This is what this is what I was getting at. You've been doing a Sprague Hasn't Seen week. Yes. Month. Which month. You, month. Month. But this same week this episode's coming out, you just did the first train spotting, which Sprague you had never seen before. I had never seen this film. And um, I liked it. You know, I, I was pleasantly surprised. It's a tough watch. Mm. But um, by the end of it, I thought, gosh, this Ewan McGregor guy, I want him to be Obi-Wan Kenobi. And of course, that, that was your main. Since then, you watched there. a whole bunch of Star Wars and then films. Then I caught up on Star Wars <laughs> and I was like, thank God, this guy really did it. It's worked out. Uh, Scott, Scott, we hey. uh, reach, reach out. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hey, Scott. Hello. Uh, reach out a while ago. So we we're doing Danny Boyle. I had a feeling you might like the guy. Asked if you had any preferences. This was one you threw out pretty quickly, yeah. which was surprising only because I think you might be one of five people who saw this in theaters. I saw it opening day America, at the Arclight, please. Hollywood. Uh, and yeah, me and I, I remember coming out of it going, I, I had zero expectations going in because mm -hmm. I was like, I love the first movie and they, what are they doing? Why are they making another <laughs> one? It, it can't possibly compete. And I and it's a very different movie, but I walked out of it just saying like, "Holy shit, that was very moving," and and that really spoke to kind of where I am personally in life. And I, I really enjoyed it. And the only other person I ever talked to who liked it was Jake Fogelnest, who had the same opinion that I did. And I was like, "Yeah, it was good." So yeah, I I've I've thought about this movie since I saw it, and this is my second time watching it for this show. Um, and, uh, yeah, I really enjoy it. By the way, you, you guys have both been on our show separately. Yes. And, mm -hmm. uh, what I, I find it really interesting in a glimpse into people's personal finances with how long they take to respond to the email. When I say, Hey, I want to send you a check for being on the show. Griffin, six months, <laughs> David, six minutes. <laughs> Well, look, I will also say that actually speaks less to our finances, yeah. although I I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe you got more cash in the bank than me, Griff. You're, probably, you're not paying you're not paying daycare costs. I don't got no baby. <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, that, that more speaks, I would say, to general email response. I think, that, okay. I think that's okay. the takeaway. Trigger the take, finger there. The takeaway is, wow, Griffin is so consistent in his poor response time that even if there is money to be made from responding to an email, it still will take him six months. I want the money. I gave you the money. I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it just is is very bizarre. The the there there is maybe I would say five percent of the people who never respond to that email, <laughs> and it's sure. it's baffling to me because I'll take I'll hey. take the money every time. I mean, look, if someone's going to pay me fifty thousand dollars to be on a podcast, I'll take it. <laughs> yes, yes. Which which is let's say one of the better rates in we podcasting. Pay too much. We do yeah, offer. We pay too, yeah, that's we pretty pay good. One too of much. the best guest rates. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just, I, if I get an email, I have to reply to it right away or I'll forget about it. Well, well that's, that's the, that's other the thing. thing. We're all, we all have our phones in our pockets and are looking at yes. them constantly. Why are we pretending that we can't just email someone of back? Right. I don't play, that's, I don't play hard to get. And you can confirm yeah. that too. Griffin. Correct. Right. I, I don't play hard to get either. I want to make it clear. No, no you're just I also bad at this. <laughs> need to respond to an email right away or else I forget about it. And yeah. what I do is forget about it. <laughs> forget about I, it. I don't hey. respond to it. I go, oh, right. You'll email? remember this. Forget about it. <laughs> forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> Get the fuck um, out of here, you man. <laughs> no this bit. is if they had been able to make a third analyze movie. Sure. Yeah. Uh, if if the, the late great thing. Harold Ramis hadn't left us. Analyze, analyze the, and the great jelly. Analyze that. Analyze with a whiff of ball bat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. It feels like that's what it would have been. Mm. If they made the the 20 years later analyze sequel, mm -hmm. if they made A3 <laughs> analyze this. Mm-hmm. 
It <laughs> would have been A3 De Niro's analyze. character struggling to do like virtual sessions. Yeah. Oh, it would have been like a it pandemic. Was set during the pandemic. Yeah. Right. It would have been forget about it with the emails. <laughs> See, I thought you were talking about like <laughs> okay, Hillary's <we've>, emails. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we'll get to well, that. Well, that's a different break. Don't worry. Yeah. Like, no, everything that's a leads serious back to thriller that. I've been writing. Yeah. And we are going to talk about Hillary's emails on this episode, right? Yeah, well, it's also a Bo okay. Biden's computer, all that kind of stuff is. All of it. All, all Who of Biden's coming computer. You never hear about Bo's. Yeah. yeah. Bo the Bo's dog? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Bo. His dual doggy computer. Oh, that's Bo. Yeah. Bo Every that's key good. is shaped like a paw. Wait, does the fr- yeah does the first dog get like a dog computer? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sure. Does Arf, it, like Arf pewter? I don't know. Let's go, come on, this is a <laughs> sure. serious podcast. We're talking about movies with two brilliant movieologists over oh, here. Okay. Good. And so oh, serious. So serious. Is there a first laptop? Like you know the thing, yeah. or, or is it like Air Force One, where this like what any computer Joe Biden uses is air is like laptop? Does one? it become laptop? Well, <laughs> the yeah, second you he know, types it, on it. all the news stories about Pelosi's laptop that they were trying to steal yeah. on that wonderful day, January sixth. Mm. Um, <laughs> they 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 they've taken great pains to to say in all the stories what she used it for, as to not mm. have there be any like confusion about oh this was a laptop that if it fell into the wrong hands, had state secrets on it or something like right. that, you know? Right. No, this is her laptop that she only uses for Neopets. <laughs> <laughs> this is her gaming PC. <laughs> right, that's her rig. <laughs> it's her Steam Deck for Counter-Strike. <laughs> she plays Diablo on there. Yeah. yeah, she does. She's a sorcerer. She's I got, she's got two fridges and five gaming PCs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what if they they had broken into her office and it was all like black with like neon oh, right. lines, like, like a Bioware? Is that the alien the 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 gaming PC a- company? A- Alienware. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. Funny. Sure. Is that funny? Yeah, that's yeah, hilarious. Gaming. Clearly, the four of us clearly know so much about gaming PCs. <laughs> I'm a little which bit is why younger than you guys, so I'm not um, getting these references. <laughs> yeah, you're too young. <laughs> uh, Scott, imagine she's uh, using them for TikTok. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I guess. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. What is TikTok named after? I've oh, never been able to understand God, that. Scott, come on. Now. That's actually a great question. I have no yeah. idea. Why is it called TikTok? It's named after the Kesha song. Oh, come on, guys. okay, yeah. The, thanks, it? Grandpa. There's, <laughs> okay, Boomer. There's like this second-tier Oz character. Tiktok, the mechanical man. Oh, I've never heard really? of this. Who, guy. who played him? He's in uh, He's Return, in Return to Oz. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. I love. Oh, loved... you thought Oz the prison show? <laughs> I thought yeah. you meant the prison show. <laughs> you remember TikTok, the mechanical man, in Oz? And I was like, I don't know. There could be a totally, sort of totally white supremacist called that. It's a rusty robot who sh- shivs people. You got Harold in the in the wheelchair. Mm-hmm. He's, yes, he, his nickname could have been the mechanical man because he has wheels yeah. for legs. Scott, that's true. That's, that's true. It's called. We can't be coming on other people's podcasts and bringing our shit to it. <laughs> Sorry. <People are> gonna <laughs> Why be not? Pissed. We invited you on for yeah. this. Now, can I ask you guys, I didn't listen to the train spotting episode that you guys well, did. you just saw the film. Movie, right. yeah, just saw the film. We didn't want to be influenced spoiled. by all of your incredible sure. thoughts. But I know you guys have already talked yeah. about it. And generally, was this one in the sort of Danny boyle verse that you liked? Were you guys big fans? Oh, love this. Certainly. Masterpiece. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And I grew up in England, as you referenced. Oh, is that right? Hmm. What street? It's <laughs> true. Uh, what street? Burley Road, in fact. Burley Road. Yeah, Burley Road, NW5. Kick the old ball. <laughs> I used to uh, kick the old ball. That's a classic right. old Spray British ball. thing. Nothing Brits do more than kick the old uh, ball. Pouring the vinegar on my fish and chips, of course. <laughs> I did do that. Sprague, where exactly did you grow up? Yeah, exactly. What well, were you on? Of into course, this. I developed my accent very young when. I was in merry old England, but then my <laughs> my parents up and moved to Tampa, Florida, where I grew up. I'm a Central Florida. But guy. originally, were you were you from the the Sherwood Forest? Or? Yes, yeah. yes, right near right. Robin of Locksley, of course. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, your neighbor. Right. Of course, that normal thing people always say. Mm-hmm. I developed my accent very young. <laughs> <laughs> this accent, I came by it honestly. It's true. <laughs> No hanky panky here. No, no, no. Um, but but I'm I, but I I wanted to ask you guys because I'm interested to talk about this film because I really like the first movie for very specific yeah. reason. Mm, and I, the main reason is it made me feel like I was doing heroin. Like it it's it's a movie that's like a great 
approximation of what it's like to be addicted to heroin. He, by the way, he's addicted to watching the movie now. He watches it three times a day. I go home and I fucking tie off my arm and, and, he, and I rent it on iTunes again and again. Right. Just buy you it. Collapse ever. on the floor in yeah, ecstasy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm under my sheets. You're neglecting your family because Scott's of it. Scott's under my sheets. He's like, hey, why are you watching the movie again? I'm like, ah, get away from me. But um, but this movie I feel like is different. It's like a totally different thing. I I was very confused by it. I would say. I think that's fair. I think that's what I like about it. Yeah, it, it, it could so easily have, I guess, tried to be like, well, let's just kind of keep these guys as they were. Let's do it with the exact same energy. Let's do it with the exact same Evoke. filming right. style. Right. Rather than being like, well, what would those guys be like if they were in their 40s? I don't know. They'd be like annoying and tired. <laughs> right. <laughs> like kind of grumpy. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. True. I mean, this is what this is one of those examples of a sequel that uses the amount of time that's passed really well. Yes. Uh, but but yes, it, it, for for such a long time, and we'll get into all of this. But Irvin Welsh, Irvin Welsh had Irvine Welsh. Irvin. Irvin. Irvin, Irvin, Irvin Welsh. Welsh had written the sequel book Porno with the same characters. Yeah. That was more of a lateral sequel, maybe. Yeah, this book is There's another adventure from those guys. It. Right. Yeah. Taking place sooner. Yeah. yeah. And I think it just would have been more of like, here are these guys with their energy up to some new tricks. They're they're up to new transgressive stuff. Have yes. you read Porno, Scott? Or have you read either of the books? Oh, the books. I, I oh, no, read I have read any porno, porno but, in life. But not oh, a, yes, the book. <laughs> um, <laughs> the dirty um, books. No, I read I, I read the original Train Spotting when the first movie came out. Um, mm -hmm. and then I I remember when porno came out and I was kind of like, "Oh, should I buy it and read it?" And I I think it didn't get great reviews, so I stayed away from it. it. Um, no. No, no one was sad. It was honestly a perfect Example of why you don't do a sequel to Transpot yeah, right. when that book came out. Everyone was like, oh, yeah, right. This is tough. But yet, even though people didn't like the book, right. they were like, well, are you going to do the sequel? And I think everyone was like, well, maybe we would only take a little bit from the book. Yeah. But that's when the conversation started in earnest of people going like, get, get the gang back together. Despite not really wanting to see that book adapted literally. Yeah. Well, I know that Danny Boyle, he's... He said he wanted to do it 10 years later, but everyone looked exactly the same because they're actors and they take good care of their faces. Right, they're and all hot. Yeah. Right. Ewan McGregor's hairline had somehow gone down. <laughs> <laughs> he had less forehead than he did in the 90s. Yeah, Scott, I want to ask you about, did, like, did you, did you see Train Spotting in the theater, Scott? Like, that's what, that's 96? Yeah, I saw, I saw it at the yeah. Sunset Five here in Los Angeles and uh, yeah. on opening night. Yeah. It was very, very into it. I was uh, super into the the music that uh, was on the soundtrack. So I was very into Britpop mm. at the time. And so to have, and then I also was into Shallow Grave, um, which I had seen mm -hmm. on video, not in the theater. But so I was, I was really primed for it. I was like, oh, Ewan McGregor, Danny Boyle, the music of Pulp and Blur. Yeah, I think I'm going to see this on opening night and, and uh, be into it. And then it, it really just kind of exceeded expectations. Um, you know, I think Danny Boyle is a really interesting filmmaker. Even when his films don't work, I think they're interesting at the very least. Yeah. Always. So, uh, you know, Life Less Ordinary, I also saw on opening night and was was less than really impressed with that. So, but um, yeah, Train Spotting, I was I was very into. It didn't take over my personality or anything. Like I didn't I didn't sit there like thinking about the fashion and the lifestyle of it and try to emulate it this, the way I did say with Ducky and Pretty in Pink in 1986. <laughs> well, yes. Oh, yeah. interesting. But that's a wise choice. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's what you're saying. It's like the whole thing with Transponding is that it is incredibly cool and it's incredibly plugged into mm -hmm. the moment it's coming out in, but it's not some airy movie about nothing. You know, it's a very tough you know, gritty, awful movie. I think that's why that's it's also fun. Lasted. And, you know, yeah, exactly. It feels, I don't know if this is what you were sort of surprised by going into its break, but it feels like it could be one, a perfect example of a movie where if you haven't seen it before, you watch it for the first time and your response is, I get why this was big 20 years ago. Right. I understand why at this moment, these new people, new star, new director coming out, hitting their stride, this would have made a big cultural impact. You can sort of view it within context. But you watch it today and it's like, it's just as fresh. I think it works as well re-watching it as it does watching it for the first time now. But it's, it's interesting, the counterpoint between the two of you of like you seeing it opening night, Scott, 
in the bag for it, it's sticking with you, and then going to see the sequel in theaters like 20 years later in real time, aging with these characters. Yeah. And Sprague just basically watching the two of them back to back and being like, they're different. They're totally <laughs> weird. No, but what you know, a swerve. I think the first one, and and I, I'm not saying I don't like the second one. I actually do like it, but I, I had more to like reckon with after watching it. The first one is like the thesis statement of the movie is so broad. And like, in my opinion, the movie is just a great depiction of addiction. And I, I just don't think that's something that's going to age. Like, addiction is happening right now. So, like, the, that part of the movie felt very relevant to me. Then the next one is like, it just feels like, okay, no, no, now we're building a big story. Like, which the first one, the story of it is like, uh, neither here nor there. I did read a review that that said it was the the addiction has changed from heroin to nostalgia. That's what I, that's, I was like looking for some sort of broad thesis statement to it. And I think that that, if you were to look at it in that way, I do think it does hold up in that it's just telling you like, yes, they're all trying to pine for the good old days. And yeah. I don't know. I mean, I mean, they, he, at the end of the first one, it's a character that gets away from his social group in order to save his own life. Mm -hmm. And this one is him realizing, hey, what if I had never done that and going back? And it's, it's something that at this age... I think you think about a lot is yeah. like, what if I had made different choices 20 years ago? You're sort of like, hopefully a little more settled in your life. And you're like, just still thinking about, but what if I had done that? What if I had done that? Should I have done that better? Should I, should I have, you know, mended that relationship with this person? Should I, should I still in, in the, and, and so that's, what's really interesting about it is to me, yes, the first one is a heroin movie but it's not really. It's about people at a certain time in their lives of a certain social class. And now what are they like 20 years later? Yeah. What's well, also like the first movie, these guys will not admit how much they mean to each other. Like they're so caught up in the energy of everything they're doing and the lifestyle. We were sort of saying like on, on our episode in the first movie, it's one of those movies where you're like, why are these my friends? You know? That thing where you're young and you sort of just like really bond to the people you just happen to be close to physically in proximity. Yeah, literally of. like you live next to them. I thought that was such a, an incredible part of this movie is the sort of, uh, it's not actual found footage, but the footage of these kids playing as kids mm -hmm. together. And then that just is all throughout the movie up till the very end where, you know, he's he's about to be murdered by Robert Carlyle. And he's saying like, remember that day that this woman sat, sat me next sat to me you? next to you and you introduced yourself. I mean, that's happened to me with someone that I then was friends with all throughout, you know, up until after I graduated right, high school and, and I still talk to, you know, it's like, yeah, it's just a very, none of that stuff is important when you're in your early twenties. So that's why the first film doesn't cover any of like how mm -hmm. they got together. Or, but but it is very important to you later in life where, where you're going back and reminiscing over like all of the choices that, that you've made. Well, there's this, this aspect that I, that I think the movie gets at well of like, um, at the end of the day, you know, you maybe go through a period of time where you're like, I can curate my friend group. Right. I can seek out people. I can, you know, I can get jobs. I can find people who have the same interests as me, who work in the same field as me, who go to the same places as me rather than friends who are sort of circumstantial and, like, handed to you as a child through school, through proximity, whatever it or like, is. I had friends who, like, my babysitter was friends with their babysitter. Right. I'm like, that's it. It's like, weird. oh, right. we both got kids to watch. <laughs> like, okay. Weird. <laughs> All right, weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> your babysitter had friends? That's freaking weird. You're friends with your babysitter? Your babysitter? <laughs> Paint the town red? Wait, are you, wait, did you not have that experience? Like, I had the, the babysitters all knew each other. There was, like, a sort of a network mm. of babysitters. They would all go hang out at the same, like, playgrounds and spots. Oh, I understand what you're saying. And, like, that's how I made... I had, like, friends where it's, like... Like, in retrospect, it was, like, my mom, like, wait, he didn't go to my school. How did I know that kid? And my mom was, like, his, your, his babysitter was friends with your babysitter. I'm realizing maybe all my babysitters were loners. <laughs> I, I, I know a guy who only had 12 friends, and he did pretty well for himself. His name was Jesus Christ. Scott, this is a no-bit podcast. <laughs> I, you know what's funny is we're talking about this and I'm realizing this movie was hitting for me and I couldn't really realize what I was like. It's not the same as the first one, but something about this is hitting and mm. I'm realizing what you guys are talking about now. I could relate to it so much because, of course, 
I came up in Florida after developing my accent in London. <laughs> of course. Of course. But yeah, as of boy. growing up as someone in Florida, like rooting, the, rooting for them devil rays. <laughs> yeah, of yes. course. But the fucking the the knuckleheads that you came up with. Like I had I was a group of four friends that we were fucking we were maybe as we weren't addicted to heroin, but we were now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, holy mm. shit. This was my friend group. I had an ultraviolet friend. I had a friend sure. who was just like yeah. sad and addicted to whatever. And I remember one day I woke up and I had texted my friends. I was like, what, uh, what are we doing today? Kind of because you just every day hung out with them. And they're like, oh, we went to the beach and we didn't tell you. And I remember thinking like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to be these guys. Like, I remember making the choice that you and McGregor made to the first one of like, I'm going to escape this friend group. And... Right. I think that's that's the choice you make in your 20s. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it, but my life, I, I think it improved my life to a certain extent. But for this character to just like go live a normal bullshit life, the choose life that he kind of was like shitting Making on in the first of, yeah. movie, he ends up choosing it and then is like, wait, this sucks too. So I, I, I yeah. do like that. Like, I, I think I think both the, the whole choose life of it all is with two characters. It's with rent boy and it's with spud mm -hmm. and with rent boy. Yeah. He, in the first one, he chooses life, which you think is the right choice. And he realizes it's the wrong choice for him because he's gone. He's gone back mm -hmm. against everything that makes him who he is. And, and who he is, is this guy who likes hanging out with losers and likes making fun of shit on TV and likes just sitting around and not doing anything. And he, he did choose what he thought was life going to Amsterdam and getting married and about to start a family, and it's not for him. But meanwhile, Spud literally chooses life in this movie. The first time you see Spud in the movie, he's trying to commit suicide, and instead he chooses life by choosing art and choosing to write everything down. And so it's like, it's these two characters making the exact opposite choice, but for the right reasons for them. No, totally. It's also interesting, you know, Renton trying to sell Spud on, like, you need to find a new addiction. It's right. boxing or it's running or it's hiking or whatever it is. And he's that sort of type A, like, there's just it's a okay. way. okay, just switch your track. You yeah, just yeah, get yeah, your yeah. life together. Right. And it's like, we're seeing him try to help Spud through that maybe 20 minutes before he finally breaks down and goes like, my life sucks. Yeah. It's like a shambles. Yeah. Spud actually has to find a thing that is an expression of himself. It's not like you can't just put the energy into a thing. Right. Yeah. But you know, I feel like what is powering this movie more than anything is the meta narrative. Okay. Yes. It's so str like of like these guys getting back together, having not spent time mm -hmm. together for many years, you and obviously reuniting with Danny Boyle, which we can talk about. Yeah. But then also just the weirdness of like, not that the other guys are the other guys are doing fine, but you and right. McGregor reemerging in their midst, and they're being like, "The oh, fuck, man, you're right. all like hot, like what's your deal, like to Jesus, like right. yeah, you're you you're Obi Wan Kenobi, <laughs> and you're coming back hanging out with us." Fuck I mean, you. Fuck I don't, you. You don't want to deal with whatever your problems are if you're if you're swinging through town. Like this movie comes out when John Lee Miller is on like season seven of Elementary, like he's making like big fucking CBS procedural Sherlock Holmes money. And even still, Ewan McGregor walks on screen and you're like, oh, right, that's what a movie star looks like. That's uh, like, there's right. a difference. This is why you guys are the connoisseurs of context. Because... As we know, Elementary got seven <laughs> seasons. I just think it's, I mean... Not I, a bad show. I, the meta-ness the meta of this movie was a little lost on me because obviously I'm watching these movies back to back. Yeah. And I'm not really thinking about the like moment in time. And when I looked at this movie came out in 2017, I was like, I don't even fucking remember this coming. Maybe because it wasn't yeah. on my radar yeah, at all. This came but, out well, during the Trump administration. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy like, that it was that recent. It's like not that long ago. The first time I watched this this sequel, I think I rewatched Train Spotting in order to remind myself of everything, but I I feel like it was weeks before. This this time mm -hmm. we literally just watched it a few days ago. And the meta textualness of it all was really hitting me because there are just iconic parts of that first movie that they are fully embracing and and sometimes oh, replicating. Yeah. Right. I mean, the the part where he rolls over a car hood and smiles at the driver just so alive, they totally they yeah. they uh, reshoot that. You know, it's it's just so much, you know, him falling backwards is mm -hmm. an iconic shot. Like so much of it, you, you even hear the songs from the soundtrack, and I know the soundtrack better than you, Spray, yes, but yes. you hear like certain songs from the soundtrack playing as if they're, they're, they're really far away a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. Like you hear the pulp kind of... song super far away, it, right. almost as if it's in a dream or it's- It's a memory. It's, it's a, a memory. Or yeah. a shadow. 
Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. You see the mother's shadow. They that do a shadow. lot with shadows. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. But there's so much of it is is about a person like. You know, even him just putting the the needle drop down on Lust for Life and immediately taking it off, going, no, that's the that's the energy of right. the first one. So much of this movie is it has no music and is so quiet, which is not like the first one at all. I thought it was such an amazing choice to go totally stylistically away from it and and tr- and just go like, no, of course they're not going to have the same energy that they had when they were in their twenties. They're going to be old. They're going to be quieter. And that's what the movie is, you know. And and plus, I I do enjoy that Danny Boyle has embraced the Dutch angles. <laughs> oh, Twenty years oh, later, at this point, right? <laughs> yeah, he's very. I mean, and of course, it's an homage to uh, Rent and having lived in Amsterdam. You know, the mm. movie goes. Very it's a very Dutch. subtle homage. Yes, right. right. Uh, do you think Danny Boyle, like, if someone brings a like a level on set, he smashes it in half? <laughs> <laughs> Get How the fuck you? out of here! I don't even want to see it. Tilt the camera, goddamn it! Yeah. Uh, no, I think I think they're they're the two meta angles. There's the the sort of reuniting the four guys of mm-hmm. McDonald, Boyle, Hodge, and McGregor, which we'll get into, and also obviously bringing these four actors back together. Yeah. At the same time, and then I also think, as as you said, Sprague, I think very wisely, this movie is sort of about like nostalgia as this new heroine. I mean, I it's said about that, but this okay. sort of. No, I'll oh, take okay. credit. Well, Scott, Scott, I thought Sprague said I think said Sprague was wisely. quoting Scott. Sprague was quoting Scott. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sprague was quoting Squat. Jeez. Yeah, you know. Um, it's sort of a Tampa trick, one of his Tampa tricks. But yeah. this has become such a... It's Tampa tricks. Uh, this has become such a thing, the, like, the Lega sequel, the bring the cast back 20 years later, the where are they now thing. And I think people asking Boyle and McGregor to get back together and make this movie predates that. But they're sort of cashing in on yeah. like... The one an antecedent audience. I think this has is the Before Sunrise trilogy, yes. which we recently covered the first one. We have not watched the next two yet. Okay. Um, and so I... But but as I was watching this, I was like, it feels like it's going to be more like that than it is going to feel like Top Gun, which right. Top Gun is trying to sort of beat for beat do exactly what the first one did and trying almost trying to say like get out of here age no it's not going to take right. us it's yeah sure he's he's going to have a slightly different job but he's still going to look exactly the same and he's still going to fly around like he's 20 and it's this one is like hello age <laughs> this fucking sucks <laughs> yes. it starts with i mean you and mcgregor literally He'd running like he treadmill. did in the first yeah. movie and having a heart yeah. attack <laughs> Yeah, and also I think this movie is he's he's on this meta level interrogating like why is this a thing we want, right? right? Like this whole thing of like, oh, these guys, it's a little depressing to see them and the energy's gone. And you're like, well, if they'd kept that energy up, they would not all still be alive 20 years they'd later. Be dead. Right. Right. Almost certainly. Things need to have shifted or, or slowed down. Or if they down had or... miraculously survived, they would just still be doing heroin in an apartment. Like right. that's not and there's <laughs> like... there's no movie. But you get to these things where people are bringing dusting characters off decades later, right? There's always this question of, do you want to see them be the same as they always were? Do you want to see old, incorrigible Maverick? They can't change him. They tried to make him in structure. It didn't take. He's still just a pilot. He's never moved up the ranks. He's the bad boy, right? And, and to some degree, that movie pulls off the magic trick of it like does. making it, it work. It pulls it off. Well, it's sequels, great. And but, sequels in general, and not even just these legacy sequels, that's the question of, of them is how much of it has to have the spirit of the original? Because I've watched sequels right. and I go... This that didn't feel like the what I like about the first one. Like I why why do I care? So there it's a real balance between how much you embrace and try to replicate the first one and also try to make it different. I mean, the one of the classic examples is Alien Aliens, you know, where it's like, hey, we're not even gonna try to be the same movie. We're just gonna literally pluralize the aliens and add a same with uh Gremlins and Gremlins 2. Yeah, totally different talked, tone. Yes. We talked about that one of like, okay. It's not hitting, for me, what I like about Gremlins. Because I was a, a big fan of the first one. It was my first date movie. Right. And I, I have watched it several times over the years. And and for me, it was not what I wanted out of a Gremlin sequel. Because it's not mm. scary. It's not doing any of the things that the ori- that what I love about the original. That said, it's It's good. successful in a different way. Yeah, it's successful in a different way. David. Yep. Choose Bombas. Oh, you I see do. see what I did there? Yes, because it's train spotting. Right. Um, yes, I do choose Bombas. I choose all Bombas the time. too. I opt in. Yeah, because Bombas makes getting active more comfortable with socks that support your sport, breathable t shirts that keep you from overheating, and underwear made to move with you. Here's what I love about Bombas. 
they also, in my case, support my lack of sport. Yes, that's true. With no judgment. Yeah. You you might need, you know, sweat wicking, blister preventing, friction free movement because you're an athlete. Right. Or you might just because you're walking, you know, to get a slice of dollar fifty pizza, because dollar pizza is hard to find, but dollar fifty pizza. Okay. We had an argument about we didn't have an argument. I uh, we, a mutual of us, friend of ours, a past a future guest, texted us and looking asked for dollar pizza. Right. And you said, I'm sorry, they're all gone. Okay. And, I didn't mean all, but they are going away. He said, recommendation of dollar pizza. And I said, hey, look, I make that two-block walk to my local dollar pizza place multiple times a week. And I do it in style and in comfort wearing Bombas. It's, it's the most true. physical activity I get on a daily basis. But I know my stuff. Look, they have socks, underwear, T-shirts. Yeah, Those are the number one, two, and three most requested items in homeless shelters, David. And that's why for every comfy item you purchase from Bombas, they donate another comfy item to someone experiencing homelessness. And so they're donating items that have proprietary hex tech, which incorporates sweat-wicking yarns, mm -hmm. supportive strategic zone cushioning, and built-in ventilation to increase airflow. They're, Look, they're good clothes. Yeah, they're good clothes and they're gym bag staple, but also I don't want you to feel like if you don't have a gym bag, you can't wear these, because no, you, you certainly can. can. No. But if, if they experience any wear and tear, Bombas will replace them for life. It's true, they got a 100% happiness guarantee. You can reach out anytime to their happiness team for easy returns, exchanges, or replacements. Look. You know what makes me particularly happy? What? That they're the number one company in the history of Shark Tank. That's true. Okay, now yep. I'm going to do a call to action. Please. Go to bombas.com slash check and use code check for 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash check and use code check at checkout. Bombas.com slash check. I, I wanted to ask you guys, because one, one thing I was thinking about a lot with this, and now that you guys even mentioned the like metatextualness of it, I, I was thinking about the new Matrix sequel. Oh, yeah. a movie we love. I'm a huge fan of that film. Another film about the limits. It's of literally about the, li like, it, it is about making thing. sequels. And I wish the new Matrix one had embraced the interesting ideas of the first 20, 25 minutes of it a little more. Yeah. Because after that, it just it turns, turns into it the just Matrix. turns into the Matrix. Like yeah. I, I love the whole movie. I do think the opening chunk is the best. But yeah, that thing that these two films touch on that I think very, I, I don't, I cannot think of any other leg of sequels that do this really, that really try to interrogate like, what is the impulse here as an audience to want to see these actors and these characters back in this sort of time loop way of like, you have to go back to do the thing you already did before, right? And do we want to see the characters we love just be the same, be just as we left them? Or do we want to see them change and evolve? And if so, is it like depressing to see them grow and lose the traits we found interesting I was about watching them? a legacy sequel called Disenchanted, and I was a little bummed that the, uh, the, the <laughs> animal <laughs> talked. The it was yes. weird that the animal, yeah, just like... No, they, but they, you, they lost what people liked in the first movie. Yeah. Griffin, what you're talking about, and it, it really yeah. feels like you're dog whistling fans of The Last Jedi. Because I a movie I love. I love The Last Jedi. And I think yeah. the people give that movie shit because they're like, I wanted Luke to just be in a black robe, shoot like slicing people up in a fucking lightsaber. And I'm like, that's boring to me. Like at, at the time that yeah. movie came out, the more interesting choice for me is like Show me like the a version of Luke that has changed and grown in an interesting way. And I think like if you know for, to to watch the movie and be like, "Oh, I'm pissed at this." And, and and it's a movie that's constantly yelling at you like, "Forget about the past. Like fuck the past. It's all right. about the future." And I think that's interesting. So movies that will I, I think sequels where people have changed dramatically and the movie is almost about exploring that is interesting to me. So I'm excited to see more of these uh, the sunset movies, the sunrise. I want to see more of those because I feel like it'll have the same kind of energy. But I, the one thing about the Top Gun sequel mm -hmm. that I want to know is who's the photographer that they hired to take the pictures of them when they get off the planes after the successful oh, yeah. missions? Because he's always got they these always like always got a picture, always got these really beautiful <laughs> pictures that he he Perfect pins up on his bulletin board, and they're yeah, yeah, they're and it's like they're not iPhone pictures or anything. So does. Does the Navy literally hire a photographer for this purpose? No, it's I Ed Harris. Actually. It's Ed Harris. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He just he's just an amateur. He's really good at it. Yeah, it's I don't like him, but the man knows his angles. <laughs> uh, I want to see the movie about that guy. That's the movie. <laughs> see, that's the movie. That's the movie I want to see. <laughs> Top Gun Pictures. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is like also who's <laughs> filming it? Like we're watching it. 
Who are these people with cameras Just filming it from different the scenes angles or something? And... Yeah, by the way, it's not one unbroken take. Like there are cuts. Who's <laughs> editing? Who's this editing film? this? <laughs> it goes from one cockpit to another. But by Magically. the way, sometimes there are lights in it. Who's lighting it? Oh my god! Who's this... lighting this fucking? It's this not... is a huge franchise. People's faces. <laughs> <laughs> it's dark. And by the way. It's a talkie. I don't know if you guys picked up on yeah, this. People are they must. They must all be wearing like sound. lav mics or something. Oh. And someone has to be checking the levels on those. Who fed these people on the day of shooting? <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I don't think this movie's improvised. I think someone <laughs> pre-planned what they were going to say. Um, well, when the yes, strike exactly. happens, that's what movies are going to be like, boy. Well, you know, anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah. Then it'll be Top Gun Chat GPT. <laughs> hey, oh boy, <laughs> that's what's gonna Forget get about. It. No, but yes, for, for this movie to start it. and be like, oh, remember that movie, the first movie, so much fun. These guys had so much, so much energy, so much fun. And this movie starts, and you're like, Young McGregor's morbidly depressed. Mm -hmm. right. Spud is suicidal, and and also is is crashing off the uh, treadmill. They yes, know, is the, yeah. the the actual and joke. his mom right. died. Like he, Begbie's right. in jail. Begby is in jail. Well, if Begby wasn't in jail, that would make no sense. Right. Begby being in jail makes total sense. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, uh, Sick Boy has basically, like, is the closest to where we left him, but he's sort of just, like, formalized his operation. He's become, like, a professional sort of... Scammer. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. And addicted to a different thing. He's now addicted to right. cocaine. Yes. Yes. Right. But he's sort of the one who's moved laterally, yeah. and it's... You know, this thing of, like, these these friends you try to get away from, and then the four of them as they're in the same place, or really mostly the main three, not Begbie as much, it does feel like this thing this movie gets at really well is when they're all in the same place, it's like, oh, fuck, right, these guys know me better than anyone mm -hmm. ever will. Yeah. They might not be my favorite people. There are just levels in which these guys understand me, the history we have, that it's, it's just, like, there's undeniably a charge to this. Yeah. And is it more depressing to roll back to the good old times that were actually kind of bad? If you really right, look wait, at fun, them, you don't even have to look at them that hard. It's I mean, like a baby for dies an in that awful movie. time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. It's a, it's yeah. Not. Well, you know what I wanted to what, what I wanted to ask Sprague is is yes. at the end of our train spotting uh, episode, mm. Sprague, you were saying like you and McGregor obviously blows the sixteen grand or t or I guess twelve or whatever, however much is his take home after mm -hmm. Spud, um, on heroin. Were you surprised at what the reality of it Yeah, I was. was trying to guess what the sequel would be about. And I thought maybe mm. he blew all the money on heroin is right back to where he started or something. But I, I was I surprised? I mean, I, I was, no, not really. Because I, as soon as the movie started, I was like, okay, the context of this movie coming out in 2017 they have to address like a long time jump and they couldn't have been addicted to heroin the whole time, you know? So right. I, I, when I saw that, like they were all sort of coming from different angles, I, I, it made sense to me. What, what I thought was surprising was you and McGregor pretty quickly being like, no, that life was bullshit. I actually want to be back in like, I, that was an interesting choice to me. I thought this movie was going to be about you and McGregor, like actually like, going around to all his friends and looking down on them and trying to change them. Right. But it was really him going back being like, what was, what did I choose before? Which I thought was an interesting choice. I, I also think it ties right. into the structure of the first one, which we talked a lot about on our, our episode of how mm. anti sort of uh, after school special that first one is structured like yeah. where he gets off heroin kind of early in the movie and then gets back on it and then gets off it again and then gets back on it at the very end. <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it it twists those expectations in this way where he comes back and you're right there there is that fear that it's like okay now i'm the you know white savior yeah, of yeah, our yeah. friend group i'm gonna come back and help all these guys and it, and even that spud scene where he takes him out jogging is like flirting it's perilously like, close to that and, and when he lies to his friend about like oh, i have a, a wife and two kids and mm -hmm. all this other shit I thought that was interesting. You think it's going to be like, okay, let's help these guys out, or or right. it's going to be these guys trying dragging to back drag him. against his will, and to have him be like, no, I actually... It, it, the, the other thing that I thought was really interesting was the fact that he has 30 years left on his heart, and that's the depressing part mm -hmm. to him, mm -hmm. is that these guys have always... And I, I sort of was, was the same way when I was 20. I was like, there's no way I see 40. Mm -hmm. And... <clears throat> then you or, or 30 even then you get there and then you get to 40 and then you get to 50 and it's kind of like 
what do you do with all the time? You know, every single person I know who's old turns into a lunatic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know like they all turn into these fucking like anti-vax weirdos who spend yeah. all their time online. So it's like, I, I can really relate to him going like, give me three years. Sure. But 30, how right. am I supposed to fill up the time with 30 years? There's something too concrete about it where it's like you, you live your life being like, I don't know, I could live or die at any moment. Right. If they give you a, a prognosis that's bad and and short term like that, you're like, well, I know how to make the most of the the three years I have left. Mm -hmm. Thirty, it's like you've now put a clock on a thing that is still far off. Right. Yeah. I I don't know what I do in the meantime. I also think he looks at his dad, and is like, well, my dad is clean. My dad chose this life that I was choosing. Right. But now his wife is dead, and he's just sad all the time. So I think he's like I lump think of a man. Yeah, I think he's looking at it like, well, what? Even if I have this thirty years, like, mm -hmm. is it just going to be fucking boring? Like, and so he goes back to the most exciting time in his life, yeah. which was hanging out with his best friend and just watching football matches and like, you know, getting high and running spouting trivia and, and running yeah. scams. And it's like, yeah, and and there is no. What I like is that there is no comeuppance for those two characters. Like, yes, right, they get ripped off. By Veronica and ostensibly, I was I was thinking about that this morning. I was kind of like, okay, so they're they lost the hundred grand. Do they just renege on the the, the small, loan? The yeah, loan, or do they do they, they go like, hey, we it. got ripped off. Here's the here's the signatures. We got ripped off, or like it. The, but the the movie's not concerned with that at all because the last time we see these two guys, they're just hanging out on the couch and they're just watching TV still, and that's their happy ending. There's the, like it's not a it's not a movie about getting back in touch with the dangerous people from your youth and getting dragged back down into it with dangerous consequences. It's about like embracing that and that being a happy ending for this guy. Yeah. Right. The ending's weirdly kind of tidy, despite the fact that they get ripped off because you're like, well, Begby's back in jail. Spud figured this thing out and the two of them have each other. Yeah. It, it's, it's romantic yeah. in this sort of uh, small and large, it's small R and capital R way yeah. where you're like, huh, I guess, this really just was about these two flawed people, Renton and Sick Boy. I would say so. Kind of figuring out that, like, yeah, they sh they're better off friends, even if, like, they're not going to accomplish much in their the, life. The scene where the two of them do heroin together again, you you know, in the sort of, like, after-school special where you're like, oh, fuck, is the next 40 minutes of the movie going to mm -hmm. be them getting Spiraling addicted and trying to into, kick it again? Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. And you're like, no, this is kind of like a, a sex scene. For that, yeah. like, this it is the really scene, is. intimacy. They cut to right? it it's like, like, here we yeah. go. That's it then. And you're like, what the fuck are they? And, and there are no consequences to doing heroin the way that there would be in another movie, right? You, you can kind of think that maybe they still kind of keep doing it, or they do, or they flirt with it. They do it occasionally. They do it with cocaine. I don't know. You know, there. It's the movie's not about that. No, it feels like you're watching like a screwball movie about fighting exes. <laughs> and you're getting to the scene where they finally yeah. admit they kind of like each other. The awful and kiss. truth, yes. essentially, <laughs> about the right. and there's, two exes yeah. getting divorced and they get back together. Yeah, like this whole movie has been them being like, you know, complaining mostly to Veronica about each other. Yeah, and being like, I have the better angle on this. Yes, I, I don't I'm know him anything. I don't know him anything. I'm gonna fuck him and over. Just, Right. Immediately her read on them when she's talking in Bulgarian is like, you two should just fuck each other. Yeah, I yeah. don't really even know what the situation is. I'm barely interested in Sick Boy. I had sex with him once and it was clearly disappointing. <laughs> and then Renton, like, hey, you're pretty cute, but, you know, I you're can tell star. you're kind of a flash <laughs> in the pan. You're Obi-Wan yeah. Kenobi, but you know what's interesting? You are about Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's weird that everyone keeps saying that to him the entire <laughs> film. <laughs> it's what's another interesting thing about Rent Boy and and Sick Boy. Is that what they are? Yeah. Renton and Sick yeah. Boy. Um, the fact where when, when you see Sick Boy in the beginning, he's like, all right, I'm going to fucking make him my friend and then I'm going to fucking double cross his ass. Right. I'm gonna, and, and I'm watching the movie like, okay, this movie's a lot plottier than yeah, the first one. Yeah, because it seems like it's going to be a noir plot. Yeah, suddenly. I'm like, okay, yes, here right. we go. And then the thing we were talking about is like they do start hanging out and they're like, actually, this is fun. And yeah, he kind of forgets about this revenge plot yeah. that he has. I thought that was another interesting choice where another movie might have gone another direction. But like this one was just like, no, no, no. Like they're angry about each other. But all this is lip service because once they get together, it's like, 
my, let's do heroin. You know, I, I the, the one good. the one sort of nod to plottiness, I think, and and where it does turn into sort of a noir plot is Begbie coming back yes. into their lives. The the only time all four of them are on screen together is that last Scene, set yeah. piece, and that's mm-hmm. where it kind of to me turns a little shallow gravy. Uh, like it it started yes. to feel like shallow grave at this point, um, right. where it's like. Uh, okay, now there's an antagonist. They're they're trying to kill him. There's a set piece where there's a you know the hanging and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But even during that, to me, it was just punctuated by so much, you know, so many beautiful lines, you yeah. know, about the th- the 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 film's theme. And even Begbie, yes, he's on the warpath, and yes. like yes, the movie does have him kind of rattling around in the background where you're like, oh, he'll eventually get loose and it's going to be a problem. Yeah, there's this stuff. But also it's like, Begbie does just want to hang out with them. Yeah. That is his plot line really in both train spotting movies. He really just wants to be invited to hang out and they don't want him to hang out because he's crazy. It's ostensibly a movie about a guy who fucked some of his friends out of $16,000, but it really is like, you left. We were friends. Yes, right. It's the personal offense of the thing. It's yeah. less the money they lost and more the idea that he would want to pull one over on them. I don't you know? know if you guys have had this experience with friends who you've kind of lost touch with, but when mm. you talk to them again, there is this like anger slash resentment slash longing that comes in these right. conversations yes. where it's like, Oh, good to see you, motherfucker. It's like, I, I, so <laughs> Begbie's whole character, I'm like, I like, understand Calling this. him cunt exclusively. Right. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it, tur- it turns into something that I really understand. And I was reading that, fi- so I, I also kind of read that Beg they they say that Begbie's character is gay in the movie. Like, yeah. this was Which kind of- sort of hinted at in the first film, obviously. Yeah. Like hinted at in the first film. Going on. It's hinted right. at in this one where he chases him down and that's when he finally could get a boner or whatever. And right. at the end of the movie where Ewan McGregor is like hanging and Begbie starts to like pull on him, I was just reading that as like an embrace. Like oh, yeah. he is he is trying to kill him, but he's like, he's also hugging him and like I was sort of wondering what it because to me it could have gone either way. It could have been like him apologizing and going, here, here, let me help you. Yeah. I was like, is he gonna right. is he helping him or is but he trying pull- to I think but he he's pulling him down, going like, come on. Like he is trying to help him, technically help him die. Yeah, yeah he's and like it's, he's trying to do it in a like, hey, stop struggling. It's Let's both see. violent and loving in such yeah, an interesting yeah. way. I, like that, I thought was a really like the Begbie stuff to me was the stuff that was working the least. It was the most like, okay, so he escapes from prison and now he's on a warpath to kill his friend. Like totally plotty kind of thing. But right. that ending moment where he's just like kind of hug slash killing him really and, worked. And for the him. the other part of it that totally defies expectations is where he as the you know primeval force of nature and the uh, you know the tasmanian devil in the in the plot who's just supposed to fuck mm-hmm. shit up mm-hmm. when he right. goes to spuds and has spud read him oh all, yes all of his writing and he loves it and yeah. he loves it and starts acting it out like that to me is is so another good. great reason to have begbie doing what he's doing because well, he, like, he's the most nostalgic of them all. Of course. Because he's literally yeah. in prison. The right. mythologizing, <laughs> even when they're the stories that are embarrassing about him, right. he's like, yeah, there's a power to this. You're you're putting yeah. importance the, on the, these The best line is he goes, events. I remember that night. <laughs> right. And that is the movie. I remember that night. <laughs> but, yeah. I, but I agree with you guys that, like, the thing with Begbie is, you know, the way he talks about losing 20 years of his life, right? How angry he is that he's been in jail this entire time. It's yeah. about what he's missing out on. And it really feels like he's like, I could have been getting up to so much shit with my guys. Yeah. In well, these that, 20 that's years. the line that Johnny Lee Miller says where he's like, oh, okay, you've given me the money back. What am I going to buy? A time machine? Right. You know, and that's, and that's what all these characters want is a time machine. And that's, it's very relatable, I think, when you get to a certain point in your age where you're like, shit, what, you know, like, uh, you know, you start thinking about, that's why I think reincarnation is such an interesting idea for people when they right. start to approach death. It's like, oh, maybe I'll come yeah. back and get to do it all over again, you know? It's, well, it's, the way, yeah. like, Johnny Lee Miller talks to Veronica and Begbie talks to his his wife, his his son's mother, they're just like, you don't understand, it was $4,000. And everyone <laughs> kind of responds to them like, look, $4,000 isn't nothing. It's sorry. Pounds. 4,000 pounds sterling. So it's like, yeah, I wasn't going to correct mean, him, it, David, but thank you for stepping thank you, in. Yeah. And it's not Scott hasn't seen guest money, but... That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And they're Scottish pounds, too, yeah. although at that point, 
Look, I, I would obviously be furious if I wasn't getting my $50,000 <laughs> for appearing on your podcast six months well, later. Well, also, we're, you're giving us 50000 to be on your podcast. So it's so kind it's of kind a just Turnabout's yeah. fair play. Yeah. I actually think it would be funny if we literally gave each other $50,000. Yeah, our, ta- our tax people would be like back that. and forth. <laughs> Uh, well, it's like it's like how Black Adam was profitable because WB bought the rights right. from itself for streaming or whatever, <laughs> yeah. and The Rock was like, "See, this thing's a money maker." But the way the way the way that everyone in the movie, when one of these guys complains, sort of goes like, "Yeah, I get it, like four thousand pounds," but you're this upset about four thousand pounds twenty years later, mm-hmm. and they keep on sort of reasserting it. The thing they won't say is like, "He fucked me over." I, I'm like, he left. I he left me. He left. He went in the middle of the night. He went out for cigarettes and took the money with him. Like, that's the fucking yeah. thing. He is no and longer, think, he he denied our friendship. He's no longer right. part Be- of our core group. Begbie's upset that he left. He's upset that he was put in jail and couldn't hang out with anybody. Right. They feel abandoned. The he thing that bad. makes him most upset is to get out of jail and be like, wait a second, you guys have started hanging out together again? again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You wonder what would have happened if, if Sick Boy would have said, hey, Begbie, Guess what? Rent boy is here. Right. Um, let's let's patch this. Let, let's you know right, let's we've, play some we've hashed it out. Let's patch it up. Yeah. Maybe you know like maybe he punches him or something. Maybe he punches yeah. him and then they yeah. all start hanging out again. But no, yeah, you're right. That's an interesting thing. Is like to be duped like that is yes, just another just indignity. It's the final thing that I think turns him into Jaws. Right. In Fundamentally, yeah. Sick Boy does not want to hang out with Begbie. No, Begbie is a horrible reason. hang. Yeah. He's yeah. only gotten worse. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, uh, and Sick Boy's like, I figured my thing out. I don't need any drama and chaos. Right. I, I have a basic good con I run. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but that, yeah, it's true. Like, Begbie is so obviously, um, you know, uh, desperate to prove his masculinity in every yeah. situation because of whatever reasons, right? Because right. he's a little guy. Because uh-huh. he's possibly a closeted homosexual. Because uh-huh. he never was given the chance to be- learn about hotel management. <laughs> <laughs> that generation didn't have the opportunity. <laughs> um, and so he has, to, he has to be motivated by vengeance. Yeah. But yeah, if Renton was just like, hey, man, I'm really sorry I took the money. Right. He'd be like, all right, you cunt, and he'd punch him, and yeah. he'd be like, all right, let's, you know, what? Are, you'd get over it, he'd probably. Get over it. And meanwhile, yeah. you, have, I, I wanna... you have Spud saying, like, heroin is the only friend who never left him, you know? David? Yes? You know, if there's a thing I've always said... And you say this all the time. Watch Netflix without using ExpressVPN is like going to a casino and only being able to play on the slot machines. You're always saying it. I always say this. And people go, why? How? Explain. Why limit yourself this way, Griffin? The big money's somewhere else. That's what I'm arguing. Because look. Yes. You got Netflix US, for uh-huh. example. Yep. Oh, here I am on Netflix US That's watching it. my Netflix show. United States, that stands for. United States of, of America. America. But then what if I'm in Britain... Turn on Netflix. Well, Lord knows what they got there. They got all kinds of gems that we don't get. Look, I can tell you a thing because David, I you just were got just back in the UK, from Europe. I was in the UK. What did you Paris. watch on Netflix UK? A Catherine Brayat movie. I'll tell you what I watched, and this is this is personal experience. I love it. Okay, because you go to these foreign countries and you find out there there are things on Netflix you could never even imagine having at your fingertips in the U.S. Right, like Pixels. I went to Paris uh, and I watched uh, Pixels. I watched Pixels on my lap. It was the last theatrical Sandler I hadn't seen, David. Great film. Here's the thing. You traveled all that way to do that. To watch Pixels. And it felt a little silly. It felt a little silly to book a round-trip ticket just to stay one night in a hotel, watch Pixels, and come back without spending $2.99 on a rental. But ExpressVPN unblocks content because it can let you control where you watch Netflix or other streaming websites. Like, you can tell Netflix... Right now, I'm in Indonesia. Right. Show me Indonesian Netflix right. or whatever. And this is the same for Hulu, uh, HBO, any of them, okay? Look, I got family members who live in Europe. I was, I was using ExpressVPN to help them watch Succession. Like, look, here, I'm looking at a chart right now. I just did this. I just used the service. That's, that's great. Like, if I switched over to, you know, UK Netflix, yeah. I could watch Attack on Titan or something. You Do know? they have Pixels? <laughs> on this chart, Pixels is not referenced, okay. but they do have whatever, you know, Canadian Netflix has Keeping Up with the Kardashians. That's sure. wild. It's, I don't know. It keeps going. Bizarre. Bizarre. Look, Imagine a world. You open up the app, you mm-hmm. select a country name, you tap one button to connect. When you refresh the page, there it is. It's incredibly and simple. ExpressVPN has blazing fast speeds, Beow. streaming HD with zero buffering. It's compatible with all your devices, phones, laptops, media consoles, etc. 
It has servers in 94 different countries and it works with other streaming services like BBC iPlayer, YouTube, and more. So be smart. Stop paying full price for streaming services and only getting access to a fraction of their content. Get your money's worth at expressvpn.com slash check. Don't forget to use my link at expressvpn.com slash check to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. And if you set it to France, you can watch Pixels. I want to, I, I think maybe we should do some of the context about getting here and then I and then okay. talk about Spud. Because Spud is very much the heart of this movie. Yes. Uh, and I think an unbelievable performance. But I, I want to talk about this film coming about. Because, yeah, you were, you were asked about this break. But basically, like, Shallow Grave, you know, comes out and it is these four guys together. It's Boyle has discovered Ewan McGregor. The film is written by John Hodge. It's produced by Andrew McDonald. And the four of them were kind of like, Don't forget about oh, Doctor is- Who, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, but the four of them carry on to the second film and the third film. And it's like, this is the team, right? These four guys are going to keep on doing this together in this configuration. And then the beach is the big moment where he had written the movie for you and McGregor. Fox goes, if you could get Leonardo DiCaprio, that would kind of change things. Yes. He drops McGregor for DiCaprio. It what, was a thing. Was DiCaprio that, coming off Titanic? Is that what it was? He was. Yes. Okay. It, was it was his, his first project after follow Titanic. up to Titanic. And basically, Fox went, we hear DiCaprio is interested. Because he's hot. You know, Danny Boyle is very cool right. at that moment. And, like, everyone wants to make DiCaprio's next movie. Right. And it was, by all accounts, a thing that was sort of like, I, n- they never really had the direct conversation no, about they, it. No, they did. They, 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 and they talk about it here, okay. which is interesting. But I think, yeah, it's a combo of... I'm saying in the moment, there I, was... Gonna, okay, gonna, okay, okay, okay. It's a combo of, it's tough to get dumped anyway mm-hmm. and Boyle says like we didn't handle the dumping well at all yeah. right. like we did not finesse that like, and McGregor was like I held a grudge I didn't try to make things better the story that's really interesting that McGregor tells mm-hmm. uh because basically right it's like so the beach is what 1999 yes and uh this movie's 2017 mm-hmm. and so there's basically an intervening 20 years of these guys like really not talking to each other except being ships passing once in a while i feel like 15 years in you hear oh they've sort of started to talk again maybe train spotting two could happen but there really was like a 15 year gap of nothing yeah so uh you know exactly so <laughs> sorry i'm trying to find the specific anecdote in the research that i found just Mac- very McGregor talks about a lot, though. It's kind of similar to the way we're talking about the the idea of the money in this movie. Yeah, in in it's sort not, of recent it's not, the, it's not the it's not that Leo DiCaprio was in the beach. Exactly. It's that you didn't come up and talk to me about you it. You feel and, betrayed right. by your and, friends. Yeah. And like there, he had made three movies in a row with thing. him. Right. He was yeah. his guy. Yes, they were they were coming up together. They right. were the new exciting British cinema guys together. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait, what the fuck has basically said now with perspective, like, I think the thing I couldn't verbalize at the time is I thought that's what my career was going to be forever. My entire sense of my career as a movie actor was the four of us make things together. And the second I was removed, the three of them were doing something with a different guy. It was less about ego of like, he's the bigger star and more about who am I, if not working with these dudes now, of course, this is happening at the same time he's already been cast as Obi Wan Kenobi. Yeah, yeah. But well, that's still, the thing. As the like, actor part of it, he gets to go right. off and do these other fun jobs, mm-hmm. and, right. but he Blue expects to be in every single thing they do. Right. He's just like, this is the team. This is the creative process. All yeah. of this, and then there's just like 15 years where they would sort of be like, I don't know. It feels weird. So the most interesting one that he recalls is that <laughs> apparently Boyle gave the news about the beach to McGregor at a place called the Union Club in Soho, but London's Soho. Mm-hmm. Ah, yes. And years later. <laughs> Uh, Ewan McGregor is there meeting a different director at the same table and Danny Boyle walks, walks in Yeah, and they see each other and McGregor like said, I went white, I got up, I went over and he said, oh God, you're not sitting at that table, are you? And Ewan was like, it was truly like bumping into an act. Wow. Like it was that level of awkwardness, yeah. especially Ugh. given the location. Mm. Yeah. So they clearly there had been some conversation of like I'm sorry, but we're right. doing this. Um, the the other anecdote, just quickly, uh, the, well, the plain one. But oh, okay. oh, sure, say the plain one. Yeah, uh, in 2009, Boyle and McGregor were on the same flight back from the Shanghai Film Festival. Mm-hmm. First class had Danny Boyle, Ewan McGregor, Ewan McGregor's wife, director Stephen Daldry. Okay, for whatever reason. Yeah, and that was it. There were only four people in first class. <laughs> And McGregor said, Daldry went to sleep. 
My wife went to sleep. They turned their lights off, went to sleep. Oh, so it's no. just me and Boyle wow. sitting like, you know, a couple seats away from each other. And it's a like 12 hour flight. And I'm just thinking like, I really should go talk to him. And I never left my seat. Yeah. So like, it's very, it's clearly like deep for this. You know, this is not just some no. casual, you know, Did, feud. Didn't you and McGregor see the beach? Like, <laughs> and just I mean, it's a good feud. point. It's a good question. Like, yeah. Does he see the beach and think, oh, bullet dodge? Right. Or does he think yeah. like, well, I, I would have been better. good in that. His like, Phantom Menace yeah. come out the same year. Yeah, the Phantom like, Menace trashes later. that movie. Right. Uh, it, no, the other anecdote. I, mean, I would the, rather the, watch the beach than Phantom anecdote. Menace. But, yeah. All yeah. right, well. The, I mean. the detail of it is basically, we covered this in our beach episode, but like they were prepping that movie, suddenly it became clear like, oh, this is a movie that's going to cost $40 million, not $20 million, which has been Danny Boyle's range. And Fox goes, we feel uncomfortable giving you $40 million if you and McGregor's the lead. Especially since their last movie was Life Less Ordinary, which right. is not exactly yeah. like now, the world. Now, if DiCaprio's right. the lead, we'll give you $60 million. Right. We'll give you more, right? Because right. he, he needs you 20. Right. Right, we'll, so, we'll yeah. tack the 20 on and free up the 40 for whatever the fuck you want to do. Yeah. And it was this sort of like the money, but the money was representing the idea of the freedom and the growth and all that sort of shit. Yeah. So when, when, does, when do things finally get mended between the two of them? So Boyle, I mean, Boyle's perspective is basically I didn't treat him well. I think he's been magnanimous about it. Like Boyle yeah. is definitely not like he should get over it. He feels bad about it. It felt like 15 years of them both not wanting to have the difficult conversation more than they were like actively angry at each other. And you, by the way, you never have to have that conversation. Like many people's lives end and they never have those conversations. Yes, yeah. so it's true. It's... it's 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 great that they did. Yes. Apparently, at some point, McGregor says he was asked to present Boyle for an award. Mm -hmm. I think this is around the Slumdog era. Okay. And he said they'd given me, McGregor said they gave me some garbage to read. And instead, I just talked about, like, you know, sort of from, from off the dome, mm -hmm. like, how much I loved him, how much I loved working with him, how happy I was always just, you know, to look over and see him on the set. And I trusted him. And then... And then he said, after I stopped working with him, I went on to make, and I listed all his subsequent movies mm -hmm. in, in order. Yeah. So Ewan was sort of like clearly doing the olive branchy thing of like, I haven't sort of been ignoring you. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I've been paying attention to what you're doing. Yeah. Right? That's kind of nice. It's kind of sweet. And I think the bigger thing about this movie is it's not just the two of them. It's like, it's the other actors as yeah. well. Like, none of these guys had really been hung, hanging out. They're, yeah, not, they were in their early 20s. Some, some of the other actors had issues as well with each other, or I don't know if they had, like, deep resentment. I, I just read, I read some weird quote that it's like, some of the other actors had some stuff going on, but they all solved it and we're all, like, back together. I think John Lee Miller has always been a little touch and go as a guy. Hmm. He's touch and go as a guy? What does that mean? I, th I think... I think He was married to Angelina Jolie. Did you know very that? Very aware of that. Yeah. Uh, I, th I, th I think he can be... Uh, I think you okay, Sprig? I, I had a visceral reaction to that. I did not <laughs> like... Thinking about the two of them together, kissing. Off of Hackers. You know, you know Johnny they Lee Miller does um, hackers. Muay Thai boxing? I did not know hmm. that. Apparently he does that. I don't know. Anytime I read yeah. about like an actor where they're like, in my 40s, I got in touch with like exotic boxing. I'm like, okay. I feel like I've heard stories about him being a moody guy. And I'm not using that as a as a euphemism yeah, for anything you heard else. that story from Watson. I did hear that from Watson. Yeah, you know, he was always on Watson's case. He showed no respect to hot lady <laughs> Watson. <laughs> um, no, I... Uh, Okay, fair enough. You know, Maybe I'm like, just jumping to no, no, an but, assumption no, if there but, was well, tension. And also, I mean, yeah. like, obviously, Robert Carlyle does the full Monty. It's not like he wasn't a movie star, but the, right. the man had a long character actor career yes. ahead of him. And you and Bremner really kind of feels like a guy who's like, hey, look, I'm happy to be here. I'm, you know, I like a good role. Incredible jobbing actor. And even just yeah. looking through his You Wikipedia and Johnny Lee night. Miller, those are the yes. pretty boys of the 90s right. at the same time. There's probably yes. a little more, you know, a I, dynamic a competition, there. sure. Yeah. yeah. Um... So but we were talking about Bub. We were, we were talking about uh, Spud. Yes. And I, I, we were getting into some of the context, and I don't know where you guys are going with this, but the only thing I could think about the entire time I was watching the movie is, this guy is Bubs from The Wire. Mm. Oh, it's the call, end sure. of the story. No, he's Spud from Transpotic. No, I yeah. know. That's oh, yeah, that's, that's so, so close. Similar. <laughs> but it's the end of the story, and now all of a sudden, 
someone's writing the story that we're watching. Like right. the final season of The Wire, this guy's like, I'm going to be a writer now. And I remember being like, oh, this is an interesting story to end with. So when the that's, final season of The Office, hey, we're the guys filming. <laughs> we're the, it's like a weird. But so when this was ending and that started to sort of materialize, I was like, how do I feel about this? The like person who's writing something in the movie you find out is writing the book. You know what I mean? Like The thing you've been watching is the inspiration for the thing you've been watching. Yeah, like they do it at the end of Game of Thrones. They do it at the end of a bunch of like narratives. Lord of the, well, and, Lord and, of the Rings as well. Mm, like They that do it ends. at the end of Lord of the Rings. Yep. So I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, do I like this or do I think this is like bad? I like the idea of Spud and the rest of them gaining something through him writing it down. I don't know if I need him to be like, and it should be called Train Spotting. I'm so <laughs> right. At the end, they cut it's away like, before Shirley Henderson says the name. <laughs> right. At the end, by the way, that's Babu Frick. <laughs> yes, oh, that is Babu, Babu Frick. Principal Speck. Yep, yep. So she, of course, slaps. But yeah. <laughs> at the end, where it's like, I think I've got a title for this. I think it's a little bit of a cheap narrative trick, but because this movie, like you said, Scott, is about that addiction of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I do think it works on a thematic levels. It doesn't just feel like, oh, it's a plot device to make begs. I, I have to say what, what makes it work for me is the fact that it's so, it's so foreshadowed in the movie. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's not something where it's like, a surprise they're pulling out right, at the end. Right. It it really is something where it's like halfway through the movie, um, you know, he's he's told, hey, you should write all this stuff down. And then you know, you know what's gonna happen then is he is the he's the essentially the the stand-in for the 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 writer of the novel. And so getting there to to me, the end having that be his redemptive arc is is very powerful because it's yeah. like you you knew it was going to happen it's about the execution of it mm -hmm. and the fact that mm -hmm. this out of all of the characters this is the one that got saved that's that's the thing because i i think in general i find this type of device a little too cute and a little too neat and i was surprised by how much it wasn't bugging me watching this yeah they i think do it for a reason the choice to make it spud is a master stroke if it was Renton doing it, I You'd would be like, throw this you. movie out a window. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. yeah. It, like, it, uh, unnecessary, right? And it, I think it's the same reason it works in The Wire. Because mm. this character who's, like, been the victim of almost all of the show. Yeah. Right, is, but is not an uninsightful person. Like, Bob's exactly. much like, you know, these are people who clearly understand things about what's going on around them. They're not. So I like, think it totally works in The innocent. Wire and in this for similar reasons. But yeah. And, and they do such a good job of setting up this character and his state at the beginning where you really want to see him find any way forward. He needs mm, yeah. something, and you don't just want him to have stability. You want him to have some sort of joy in his life. I, I find that first uh, sort of uh, uh, meeting scene you see with him where he just explains the chain of events that fuck up being 10 minutes late and then 10 minutes late and then 10 minutes late right. and then 10 minutes well, late. One, one hour because of... Because of, yeah. of uh, daylight, daylight saving. Right. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, then he, but then from then on out, he's late to everything in the rest of the day and right. he's yeah. losing custody yeah. and now it's like, well, now we're just back down to heroin. Like yeah. he tried so hard to structure a proper life for himself and it goes away so quickly and he falls back to the thing but it's he a knows. Good evocation also of his storytelling skill yeah. slash whatever. Like I also uh, think flaw. it's important, by the way, that the movie doesn't end with like him at a book signing mm -hmm. or yes. something. The movie where, sure, that where, where the rough. movie ends is with Babu Frick <laughs> reading right. the stuff. That's right. that's all we need is just the fact loosely that his he now has the respect of his right. family. Long hand. And, and I also think it's like, it's part of it is just, he's not like, I'm a novelist now. He's like, I needed to put this down. Like, I need to sort of like do right. something to exercise this energy. All these things I've been sort I, of like. And I love, I love that Ewan McGregor is like, who's going to read it? No one. <laughs> like, right. no one's interested. But in then it. he says, I don't know, maybe my grandson or something. Right. And I think that is what happens at the end. It's just like someone from his family reading and understanding his story is all he maybe needed. I don't know. There's also this beautiful thing. I mean, it's like another meta level, but this, you know, Transpiring is a book, then they do it as a stage play. Yeah, and when yeah. they did it as a stage play, you and Bremer played Rent, Rent Boy. Yes. Yeah. And it was kind of the thing where they set this up as a movie. He's like, I got it. They needed a movie. So they needed someone they, who was they, more I'm not going to play Rent anymore. I'll be spud. That's I fine. I appreciate right. that they let me play the goofy sidekick part. So there's something kind of nice to having him suddenly be the guy telling the story, you know, doing... Yeah. I love this quote from Ewan yeah. Bremner. He says, it opens with someone running and going nowhere. I mean, it's fucking brilliant. You read it, 
and you think this is how the sequel starts. Oh, it's ambitious. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, he, he, but the other thing is like, this is, you know, basically just the idea of like, we've all been running for 20 years to stand still, not yeah. to, not to invoke you two, the great band you well, two, but Hey, you talking you two to me? I might be. <laughs> um, but, uh, this is a less, you know, this is a less gnarly movie than the original train spotting. They're yeah. doing less drugs, but the, um, the sight of him barfing. I was going to say into the bag during his suicide. Yeah, it yes. starts him off really like a barf helmet, basically. Rock bottom. Yeah. That is tough. Like it's already right. tough. Yes. He's being discovered in this, you know, sad apartment mid suicide attempt. Yes. He can't even pull that off. But then just throwing in the barf to really drive home. Like this guy is is you know. It was interesting yes. to me because the first movie is very obsessed with shit, mm -hmm. yes. and there's a lot of like nasty shit in the first movie, and in the beginning of this when when he barfs into his like suffocation bag, I'm like, okay, here we go. Like there's going to be four or five times where I'm going to be totally grossed out by something happening, but it doesn't really do that. Yeah. That was no. the only one. But I, yeah. but I, what I like about it is they're kind of telling you that you're like, no, well he's still in that. He's still the yeah. closest to that world. Yeah. yeah. You, the, the last time you saw him, he was spreading his shit all over the family. <laughs> right. Now he's, he's, he's speaking into a bag. Yeah. And I thought it was successful in that, like a reminder of where they came from in a way. Yeah. I thought that was fun. I thought that here's a question for you guys. Cause I think you've, you might know this, but so the, the title train spotting on our episode, the previous episode, we talked mm. about what it means and, and where it came from in the book and the, the scene, uh, from the novel that gives it its title, Train Spotting is not in the first movie. Right. right. Um, but then they show it in this movie. I was wondering if it was a deleted scene or whether they reshot it and shot it dark and shot it from oh, far that's away. That's a good question. Because they reuse so much footage from the first they, movie. Yeah, it started to make me go, Oh, I wonder if they actually shot it for the first movie, realized it didn't work and cut it out, but now they're they're showing this footage in it. Because it if if you don't if you haven't seen the movie for the listener, it's it's where the old man in the train station. Yeah. Uh, sees them all and says, what are you guys doing? Are you train spotting? Which is an allusion to shooting heroin. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then it turns out to be Begbie's father. Right. Um, I don't think that's some deleted scene that they revived or anything mm -hmm. like that. But it is interesting that they... And I, I didn't mention that, like, when porno came out, mm -hmm. John, you know, they were like, all right, John Hodge, you know, take a crack at it. And he said he did, like, a screenplay that was basically an adaptation of the book, and everyone was like, this sucks. Right, we're not getting back <laughs> together for this. <laughs> like, like uh, genuinely, by the way, like, Hodge, th that's Boyle. hard. That's hard uh, feedback to get from yeah. people. Hey, this sucks. <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> like, Danny Boyle was like, I didn't even yeah. want to show it to any of the actors, like, to try and tempt them into, like, hey, do you want to do a sequel? I was like, that, because I knew it would just kill the idea. Right. So and, and porno is like mostly about them trying to make a porno, right? No, like it's, it's about like a, them trying to open a brothel in Holland, mostly. Oh. It is this so this movie borrows stuff from it. And Begbie is kind of has a similar arc in it of like he's in prison trying to get out and all that. I thought it was like full Zach and Miri, like let's get the gang together. And <laughs> Muse is there. Let's yeah. all fuck each other on camera. <laughs> yeah. Um no, uh, so, right, that's the thing. Like, when he then eventually is like, all right, let me try writing a sequel uh, screenplay mm -hmm. again, I think he takes some stuff from sure. porno, but not all of it. Takes some stuff maybe that's kind of inspired by real life. Mm -hmm. But maybe he's also going back to the original book and being like, what didn't I use here that I could, yeah. You know, yeah. That yeah. I could conjure up? I think like, I read that's, they that's used in... some stuff from the original book. And I think what's really brilliant about that scene with the train station is, like, it is in a moment where they're reading a story from like it yeah. is in the past like it is almost like this happened in the first movie but we didn't show it to you right yeah. i think it's just a, sort of a clever way of not like including it in this movie as a flashback well, it also but, isn't just on its own it's there to inform begbie's yeah his choices of him his, him right, realizing son, yeah. oh shit i need to be a better father mm -hmm. than my father was for my son you know that that scene where they're eulogizing Johnny, basically, right? Johnny is the yeah. the character I'm thinking of from the first movie. Yeah, the uh, yeah. Kid character, right? And they go back to the train to station the and the right. uh, yeah. the hiking right. center. Yeah, exactly. And then and then it it turns into them like attacking each other for the worst things they ever did. Right, right. That's when he's like finally playing the baby card at Johnny right. Lee Miller. Yeah. And then the fact that that goes straight into them doing heroin again. It's it really was like, fucking interesting. Right. This weird, like, this is the most intimate thing they can They're do. They're like summoning up the ghosts. And right. That's, yeah, is finally have the conversation. Right. 
uh, like it, it feels like the much more extreme version of Boyle and not and McGregor not talking to each other about the thing in the center for 15 years, and then it immediately cuts to them doing the most intimate thing. I thought you were gonna say it's the more interesting Sam and Diane kiss, where they're like yelling at each other, they're screaming, they're mad. Mm. And it's like, are you turned on? I and it's like, are you turned on as I am more? And then they right. kiss. But right. in this movie, they do heroin. Yes. Right. No, but it is. It's the same sort of like what we're talking about, the screwball banter thing of like you have to fight up to a fever pitch before you acknowledge like the thing here is we just want to fuck each other. I, I also, I mean, I, I don't know that I necessarily feel that it it's it's one of those Sam and Diane things. I think I think that I think the heroin classic Sam and like Diane. them them addressing these worst things that ever happened in their lives mm-hmm. makes them Puts them back in it. Yeah. And makes them need the heroin. Makes them need the heroin. Like, that's, been that's where I sort of... It and, right. Yeah. yeah. I mean... Just like when the baby dies in the first one, the first thing they do is shoot up. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. almost like bringing up those ideas again. It's just, you gotta go right back to the, the thing that was helping yeah. you in the right. first place. I mean, Sick Boy does not strike me as a retrospective person. No. In any way. No. Right. Renton a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But even Renton has obviously tried to build up a tidy backstory for himself when he returns to be like, hey, I'm not like you. I mean, I, I think it's so funny when he returns and he's got a movie star scarf. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's like, yes. he, with the perfect nod. <laughs> right. And it's just, it it's you and yes. McGregor. It's it, like you and McGregor is walking in. That's the thing. Yeah. Being it, it like, hey like guys. That thing where got a, a, Golden Globe. a big Ooh, star man. sort of returns to their roots and they're like, but they're not going to drop the stylist. They have a look <laughs> cultivated that they're not going to let go of now. And he has, wait, he has the long hair on the treadmill, right? That's the, yeah, he has yes. more of an Obi-Wan, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. sort of Revenge of the Sith, Obi-Wan, yeah. you know, long hair. I was going to ask, can we talk about the Veronica character? Yes. Oh, sure. Yeah, the one new character. Yes. The one new sort of main character. I, I, I find her interesting in this movie. I think, like, I keep trying to think about, like, what, is the purpose of her character. And I think, I don't know, there's like a, she brings a bit, a bit of reality for being like an outsider in this friend group. Mm -hmm. Like I like when she's saying all that stuff, like you should fuck each other. And she like has a perspective that is outside there. I I don't know. But it also is, I think, you know, contributing to what you may feel is sort of plot plottiness of it because she has the typical femme fatale role Mm -hmm. in a noir movie, which is essentially the two guys are going to fight over her. She's going to fuck them over at the end. But it never, it also never really crosses over into like, in a noir movie, it feels like, you know, these people getting fucked over is, is life and death, life and death consequences. And they just kind of like shrug it off at the end. And mm-hmm. and it's like, yeah, well, you know, we would have done the same thing. I, I, I feel like it was everyone trying to replicate knowing they need to replicate basically what Renton does in the first one, mm-hmm. fucking everyone over mm-hmm. sort of the book ending with those and having it be ironic. But, but it is the most like movie ish yeah. of, I mean, of, of the, of the entire movie. Boyle loves making a fucking bag of money movie. It's like yeah. insane. <laughs> Even when he so made his times. children's film, right. it's about a little boy finding a big old bag of money <laughs> and scary yeah. men chasing after him. But but I think he just likes having that as like the the actual object in the center of the room that you can build all the drama around. But it's um, weird because the bag of money in the first train spotting is yes, technically it's what the entire choice at the end hinges mm-hmm. on. But we were talking about in our episode. It comes in late. It's it 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 comes in late, but it also is not dealt with in the typical like uh, '90s pulp fictiony type of yes. way, where, which is like. They're going after this big score and then it all goes awry. And every, you know, they just basically they go after this big score. They get it. They get it. And they all go, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they just celebrate. <laughs> right. You know, but, like this, this is like they they get their big score, they get a hundred grand, and then she slowly fucks them over the way that yes. it happens in noir movies. So it's it's a little not exactly true to what the first movie w- did, which was be a little more realistic about it. I, I don't know if, uh, I assume neither of you has seen Trance? Uh, no. no. Okay, so that's no. two movies before this. Sure. Uh, Boyle, his big noir twisty who's conning that's who the thriller. One Rosario Dawson? Right. Yes. It and stars Rosario Dawson, James McAvoy, and a distinct lack of pubic hair. Uh, but that movie, because this is... 
that's a huge plot point. Scott plot point. seemed like a weird comment. You bristled at me saying that. It's almost <laughs> the central plot point of the movie. Um, <laughs> well, well I, I didn't bristle because most of the times that I talk to you, you're talking about somebody, somebody's pubic hair. <laughs> yeah, you leaned in when I said it. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> Veronica set up at the beginning of this movie. I was just like, fuck, is Bull doing this again? Because mm. that movie gets, although I kind of like it, gets a little exhausting with how many, like... Yeah, it's every 10 minutes. Right. Someone's the, fucking someone Destabilizing else everything. Yeah. And, and even just her having conversations with both of them, I was like, are you going to have an ending where you realize this whole complicated thing she's been doing the entire time? I like that it's pretty low stakes. It's low. It's lower stakes, which, uh, which I think makes it work for me because it's just like, you, you're expecting that moment where she's been playing both people right. against each other and then she right. fucks them both over and it's it's pretty much obvious she's going to and she does it in a low stakes way and she does it and i think what also makes it work is the fact that she's going to give spud his cut yes and he turns it down you know realistically says i right. would just spend it on heroin she goes well i'll give it to your family then you know it's like it, it all feels very low key in a way that most noir movies don't because can i give you my take on it yeah I think she's vitally important in the movie because mm. at the end of it, I, I was thinking, I was like, what is her role in this movie? And at the end, she ends up screwing them over and taking the money. Almost, I think she saves their relationship because she knows from learning these guys, right. they're going to fuck, one of them is going to fuck the other over, over and then it's yeah. going to be total bullshit again. So the fact that she pulls the money out of the situation it is allows for the happy ending of them just sitting That's on the interesting. couch. Yeah. And I, and I totally was sure. like, Oh, interesting. Like it is a little bit of a, like, Oh, you find out about the signature thing. And then I like that spud is like, I, what would I do with the money? I would just do heroin. Him refusing the money made me think it's right. Like the money is bad for them. Yes. So the fact that they get the money is like kind of the ticking clock of like, what's going to happen next. With yeah. This because money. I, I guess it could have been like, is Ewan McGregor going to fuck Johnny Lee Miller over or right. is Johnny Lee Miller going to fuck him over? And, and you know Johnny Lee Miller is motivated to fuck him over yeah. at this point because it's like, well, you fucked me over in the past. Yeah, and they're both they're both doing it with the other bag of money, which yeah. is essentially her. Yeah, Like totally. they're trying to fuck each other over when Absolutely. it comes to her as well. And so the fact that she goes like, I'm removing myself and, the money. and the money. Yeah. And the money. Like, cause like, it gives them the happy ending. They're not going to succeed at no, being criminal. No. Like the guy, when the criminal guy kidnaps them and takes them to the woods and he's like, listen, so I am in charge of brothels and such. <laughs> yes. You know, this is organized crime yes. and that's my yeah. job. So I you guys won't be doing all. that, yeah. right? Yeah. And they're like, no. And he's like, all right, great. Right. Like he doesn't even have to threaten them. He's just kind of like, look, listen. Walk like, home naked and you're fine. <laughs> exactly. Not even the money, but the idea of the money is like the final space between them, which she's able to remove that that gets them to be able to fit on the couch together just, again. Like, jerk off together. Take right. And like the tragedy <laughs> of Spud is like, you know, Renton comes to him and is like, what about the money? You were the one guy gave the money. He's like, I'm a fucking heroin addict. I spent addict. it on drugs. I spent it on heroin. <laughs> right. When Begbie comes to him and finds out that he got extra money, that he was yeah. the one guy who was given money by Renton, he's twice as irate, you know, <laughs> that the yeah. money went to him and that he blew it on heroin, you know? And it's like, he oh, has... he didn't abandon you completely. Right. Like, it, it is, yeah. It well, that's so. the other thing is, is you, okay, what if they never got fucked over and they split the money? Right. Would anyone's life be different? No. Would Begbie's life be different? I doubt no, it. it was because not that much I, he's, money. Yeah. He's and he's not in. Forgive me if and correct me. Forgive me and correct me if I I'm wrong. Give you. But um, he's not in prison for what he did in the first movie. No. Right? No. He's he he's he's been in because he's gotten married and had yeah. a kid since. And then. he has so, all right. these other the, connections. The, the yeah. film is also beginning with him getting an addition. His lawyer is telling him you're getting another five years. Yep. Clearly, because of some shit he He's, did he in prison, shit. Right. right? Yeah, like so. So yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think the money changes their lives at all. No, I, I think the only one who's changed by it is is Renton running away from them. But I think yeah. those three guys are in the exact same place, regardless of what amount of money he does or doesn't give. And them. Renton's change is temporary. Like yeah. it, it, yes. he eventually yeah. comes right back to where they were. Yeah. But but Spud's whole introduction is this sort of like I tried so hard to be a person. I genuinely love Babu Frick and my <laughs> child. I tried to do right by them. I keep fucking our little up. Fricks. Yeah, I Blank keep shitting flat. in the bed. You yeah, know. I keep shitting in the bed, and she right. keeps weirdly criticizing my healthy sized penis. Right. Yeah. I don't know if you guys <laughs> touched hates, on that. She right. hates his giant flaccid cock. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that somehow is a small penis. 
Yeah. Okay. We, we got, listener feedback was, is she disappointed that he's not still hard while passed out? Yes, maybe that's what mm. it is. Mm. But I don't know. Which makes her a dang ass freak, if I sure. if I dare say. Yeah. But but yes, no, it's like Veronica says the thing to him that he's never been able to put together, which is, I'll give the money to them. He's right. like, yeah. well, I'll mm. fuck it up if you give it to me. And she's like, I know I what your intention you. is. <laughs> you wish you could give it to them. Right. Mm. So you don't trust do yourself. That. I'll right. give it to them. And and I think it's interesting. You talking about her her being Veronica being a vital part of this movie, right? We're basically only two female characters of any yeah. real size. Begbie's wife to a much lesser degree, right? Not really. But you have the one big Kelly McDonald scene in Veronica. Kelly McDonald's function in this movie is to be like, "Fuck, we need help. Do we know anyone legitimate?" Right? right? <laughs> and yeah. it's sort of yeah. like embarrassing that for McGregor for Renton. It's like, who's the most upstanding person I know? That teenager I fucked 20 years ago, right? <laughs> right? She made something of herself. They show up in the office. She's not being rude, but she has this sort of cocked eyebrow of like, you're really coming to me about this. You don't know <laughs> right. anyone better, right? Yeah. He doesn't understand the difference between an hourly rate and like an overall return. Yeah, that's or a good gag. Like, what, what was like, the rate that he thought reasonable. it was going to be like, right. oh, uh, I'm going to pay you $50? And you <laughs> yeah, take incredible. Yes. That's <laughs> reasonable. Very generous. It's a good hourly rate. Oh, right. Gag. Well, I, I think her other role is, is, and it's so brief, It's it's just for, it's the tiny scene where he's looking at her in the office later yes. And reminiscing about, well, what if I had stayed and tried to make something, which is just ridiculous because she's a teenager yes. in the first one. If he had really tried to make a go at it, like what that it doesn't make any sense. But he sees her as like, well, what if I had been with her? What would my life have been like? You know, like I uh, maybe I would be living the same life you're living. Right. Meanwhile, he's walking to an office with a new young woman. And the thing she says is she's way too young for you. Don't fucking do this. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and like for him, we see her family in the first movie. She's got a good home life. She's got a support system. Her yeah. time with these guys is very much like youthful rebellion, but she's yeah. never sinking all the way to the bottom with them. You know, it's a, like a little bit of tourism. It's a little bit of fun. It's a little bit of learning. She was never, ever going to get stuck in this shit. Whereas yeah. these guys, it's like bone deep their lifestyle. And Veronica feels like she exists in the trenches with them. But then you're like, no, she's like a fucking immigrant. She's, she's here like out of circumstances. Young. She's young. She's trying to get back to her kid. That actress, like, which, she, is, which she never mentions. You just see at the course, end. But yeah, it's like, right. it's so the final piece is like, everything she does is out of necessity. These guys, it's bone deep. This is who they they're are. Stuck. It's where they're comfortable. Right. Yeah. And they like for it. Kelly McDonald, it was a phase. And for Veronica, it was a necessity. And for the two of them, this is where they will always be. This is their ceiling. Right. Yeah. I mean, her name is Angela Ned Yalkova. She mm. is Bulgarian. She's done very few films, just like a few Bulgarian. I don't know where they, like, you know, found her, essentially. Mm -hmm. She's but good. I think she's, she's quite good. Yeah. She's yeah. very yeah. beautiful. Yeah. She's fun. She's, mm -hmm. like, kind of loose. She's, like, got the energy they need, I feel like. Yeah. I yeah. also will I say... I couldn't tell she was beautiful because I was looking at her eyes the, the whole time. Oh, okay. Well, and, and never lower. Yeah. Well, and she says, Scott, Scott my tits sometimes. are down here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also think it's interesting that... Broad City walked so this movie could run when it comes to pegging scenes. <laughs> well, sure. Sure. Because true. I do think that, like, when this started, I was like, when did this come out? And so I kind of looked it up and I was like, oh, yeah, like, pegging had come on the scene as a phrase everyone knew. I don't know, around like 2015 or something. And You're then forgetting it's something. the big part of the beginning of this movie. You're forgetting something, though, Sprague. What am I forgetting? 2016, a little merc with the mouth. Dead oh, yes, of course. Got Deadpool. pegged on screen. Three hundred million dollar domestic. Suddenly, it's you know, that's popular. what it was. You know, Danny Boyle was watching Deadpool, and he was yeah. like, "I got a little something for my movie." Pegging's mainstream now. <laughs> we can talk about it, but it's funny. I do think that that's an interesting choice because I think, mm. like a lot of the movie, like being emasculated and your masculinity yes. there's like so much of that in this movie with Begbie and other characters I think, well, I think it was an interesting choice I think there's a little bit of like life philosophy to even this con for sick boy that is like there is an intellectual dishonesty right uh, hypocrisy to these guys being able to like being so terrified by the notion of anyone knowing their sex life sure. <laughs> that it plays against it. I think he's having no moral judgment about what they're doing. No, he doesn't care. He's right. just trying to get money out. But he just sort of knows, like, the idea of an upstanding citizen being pegged. 
a thing you can never admit to your wife that you need to do in secret in a shady clandestine kind of way uh, is, is the greatest threat to this delicate sort of like life, the type of life that McGregor has been trying to live, the white picket fence, the straight job, all of that mm, sort of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The sort of like, just what do you enjoy? What's your pleasure, you know? Needs to be shameful, needs to be in dark rooms. Can we get that as a drop for the next episode? <laughs> <laughs> what's your pleasure? Yeah, what's, what's your, your pleasure? pleasure? <laughs> it needs to be shameful. It, it needs, needs to be, be in dark. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll send it in as a Doughboys drop next week. Okay, good, Thank good, you. good. We should start doing that. We should start doing drops of our own audio and sending it to Doughboys. Just just our own, just us yeah. talking. Well, well you know, uh, like, our our producer Brett, uh, for yes. Scott hasn't seen, did a uh, cut out for David's uh, episode that we did about the movie Gigi. Mm. He cut out me just uh, re reciting the lyrics to "Thank Heaven for Thank Heaven girls. for Little Girls" <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a couple of the lines. He's like, "Should I release this?" As a, I was like, "Absolutely." Fucking Lulee, not incriminating, incriminating. That the is movie the is cold, rated G. Cold open of that movie, and they were rushing to hand it Oscars. There were there were not enough Oscars that Saint year. Kevin yeah. Yeah. for the little girls, girls. The little way they walk, and you were like, "What? The, don't get into specifics." T T2 Train Spotting is one hundred percent less depraved than Gigi. There's that is undoubtedly. Mm. What about G two G Lee? Mm -mm. Can we talk about my Gigi. favorite scam Jesus. in this movie, please? Yeah. I think my favorite scam is pretending you've written a song. <laughs> <laughs> that I love. But that it's in that moment. Great. Like, I really thought that scene where they go to the like 16, 19, yeah. 16, sort 90. of, or whatever it is, get gathering. And then they, that's everyone's pin number. Like, yes. I thought that was just a nice little inventive, like, it's really fun. It, it's a small, like, episode in the movie, but I thought it was really fun. Well, it also had the specificity of, like, it's midnight. We can get more out. Yeah. You know, just like was such fun. a, such a, you know, coming from a background where it's like, where I've ran tiny little scams mm -hmm. here and there. It's like, oh, yeah, that's the kind of thing that you think about a lot. When, is, you, when you're in the heroin brain of, like, how do you get to, but, but then the fact that it, like, is hinged on them singing this song. Like, yes. I want, what's the story with this song? Like, what is up with that in the script? It was such a weird moment, but I like well, I liked also, it. I, I also think it's like, it to me was the where suddenly the movie started to feel like the first one. Mm -hmm. And because the first one we were talking about on our episode about how Sprague here had thought that it was maybe going to be more of a requiem of a dream type of movie mm -hmm. where tonally, where it was going to be like all about the perils of heroin. And instead, the first train spotting is so much of a fun movie where they're going around doing like you, you were talking about them shooting, shooting the, sh the, shooting the, the pellet gun in the park. You know, th so that suddenly they're doing a scam. Suddenly, you and McGregor starts to feel like his old self again. Yeah. The movie starts to feel like the first movie where they're where it's suddenly like this. It's kind of a broad comedy scene, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it's yeah. the first time there's a broad comedy scene in the movie, and then they get back in the car, and that's where Lust for Life starts to play, and the 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 old music starts to play, and it's like, oh, okay, oh, yeah, we're yeah. back into the world of Train Spotting again. But then you also have the the Choose Life scene in this, right? The inversion yes. of the original Choose Life that is like. Oh, this kind of doesn't feel fun anymore. Right. Where she's like, "What is that?" And he's like, "Ah, it's this great bit we used to do. Let me. All right, let me <laughs> yeah. try and dust this. Let me off. do that. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, well, then, with him going to his childhood bedroom with the trains and putting mm -hmm. on Lust for Life and then taking yeah. it right off. Right. Right. Like where yeah. he's like, "I can't. I can't handle that." But it's that thing. I mean, like as Scott, I'm sure you have seen this too many times. Something Scott has seen. Mm. Uh, uh, like comedians trying to do like angry bits. And yeah, that fine yeah. line between someone being funny, angry, and the entire audience going like, oh, we just saw a little too much of something. Sure, this guy's just Not like danger, but it's like uncomfortable anger. Well, it's so funny because like the difference between normal stand-up comedy, which is usually done in clubs and mm -hmm. theaters, and then what we used to do when we would book the Comedy Death Ray show at the UCB was we were trying to get rid of the barrier between the audience and the and the performer. Mm -hmm. So that's why we would have the the audience sitting on stage with the the performer and everything would be up close and the lights would be turned up. That's why Todd Glass would always yell at us, like, turn the lights on the audience down, because he wanted there to be a barrier, right? Well, and he yeah. wanted reverb, obviously. I yeah, yeah, obviously. Mic, <laughs> but yeah. but but you would see he wanted comedians... a check drop. He asked you to make fake checks to drop it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you would see comedians used to performing with 
in clubs where there's a barrier where it's a performance mm. and they would do the angry bits like that to applause because everyone is watching a bit like that of like, whoa, you performed, you memorized a thing. Yay. Right. 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 And you would see people do that at, at our show and people would be uncomfortable because it's like, dude, you're doing this rehearsed bit. What, yeah. what is happening here? And that's what it feels like in this movie when you and McGregor does the choose life thing and she just kind of like sits there and just like, like okay. really? What is this? He goes, well, I yeah. mean, you know, it amused us at the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is so funny because in the first one, it's kind of just happening. Right. He's it's just doing over. it. Yeah. To, maybe right. to the running, audience. Running, yeah, and the yeah, audience is like, is yeah, moving. this is fucking cool. Yeah. yeah. And now yeah, in this yeah. one, it's like someone's sitting there listening to it and you're like, oh, this is what it would be like well, if I was sitting next yeah. to someone saying and I think that's a great. Yeah, I mean, also, yeah, if some guy in his mid-40s was like, yeah, man, I mean, I don't do what normal, I don't choose <laughs> like the, yeah, that everyone yeah. else takes up be like okay like but this proud is proud of you it goes back to what i actually like about the the spud writing the stories element yeah. of the movie is like and i believe i didn't mention this before like his stories are written they're right out of the book right out of the urban it's, right, it's right. Urban like they're in that dialect yeah. and all that wording right, yeah, yeah, right. right. so it's the kind of stuff that he would have played as renton on stage right right sure. right yeah. um but but also like I have not read the train spotting book, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, similar to let's say Clockwork Orange, I, I I remember reading that and thinking like, this is weird. So was the internal logic supposed to be that this guy actually sat down at a typewriter and wrote this? When you have a book like that by a character that extreme, like Alex Delarge, yeah, right? Make right. Sense. Or Renton, and the book is first person, they're like, let me tell you a story. I'm right. like, I don't think this guy wants to write. <laughs> also, sure. right, who was filming Top Gun? <laughs> I mean, that's the movie I want to see. <laughs> um, well, no, I, but I mean, back to the Choose Life monologue, though, I, I, I think now that we're talking about it, it is sort of the thesis for making a sequel 20 years later is yeah. like, how embarrassing would it be if we were doing that? Still. <laughs> like, we're all right. old. How embarrassing right. would it be if we were still doing that? You know, and it's it's something you could say about Star Wars. Yeah. It's like, how embarrassing is it that you're still making the movies and the TV shows exactly the way that they were made in 1977? That's why I think that scene is so perfectly written, because it ends, and then he goes, I don't know, it was some shit we thought was fun. <laughs> right. yeah. it is that good. is so McGregor good. nails it. But I like that, that is, distance, yeah. too, of just like, if you're asking the question, like, why does Trainspotting as a book exist? If I'm supposed to take these characters as real people, I'm sharing their story with me. Sure. Right, and you're like, oh, it's Spud is the one who 20 years later has the distance. The fact that he's not, quote unquote, and the, the main character. Facility. Yes. And he's yeah, like, yeah. I get that Renton's kind of the leader of this group. Right. I could retell this. I could do it in this sort of voice. I can take this perspective and that and the language, you know, being the same as in the book that he's not doing some it, it flowery is, memoir. It is also just funny to think of Hugh McGregor as the man who replaced Alec Guinness to play yes. Obi Wan for a new generation, and then by the time this movie people came out, people were like. I'm nostalgic for your, for your take thing. on Obi Wan right. Kenobi, <laughs> like your refreshment of that character. I am now nostalgic for it. Can you do a similar legacy sequel in which you're like, oh, I haven't been a Jedi in a while though. These old bones. Yeah. Well, okay, what's more successful, T2 Train Spotting or the Obi Wan miniseries? I think T2 Train Spotting yeah, oh, is wi wildly more yeah. successful. Th yeah, there was a Kathleen yeah. Kennedy interview like a year ago where she was like, the main lesson they were like, what are the lessons, the mistakes you've learned from these last eight years of doing Star Wars? And she was like, I think the main lesson we learned was like Solo, you can't recast the classic characters. Like people want the integrity of the original actor. Right. And she's saying that in an interview promoting Obi-Wan. Right. But she's like I, basically yeah. like, I, I, Ewan's Obi-Wan has now become a legacy character almost distinct from yes. Guinness Obi-Wan. I yes. think she's wrong, but I do think this new Obi-Wan show would have been better if there was a long monologue where he says, I choose the force. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That would be I think fun. it would have yeah. been, that would have been fun if for If he was me. like running on Tatooine and then he got like hit by a speeder. Yeah. I just, <laughs> and he sort of rolls over the dashboard. He smiles and says, hello there. And then yeah. Hello like, there. Can right. I ask you guys a question? Anything. Um, and, and this might be a little bit of a, a zig here, but General Grievous gets out of prison. He's trying to get him. Like, hey, you fucking <laughs> cunts, I'm coming for you. No, it's like, go on. What's up? Uh, we can keep doing that. Um, <laughs> no, but that's fine. Another movie we watched in Sprague Hasn't Seen Month 
mm. is Raging Bull. And there's a Raging mm. Bull oh, reference yeah. I was in so, this movie. I was so happy that you'd seen Raging Bull so before. I could get it. So you could get it. But I, I think it's so funny because it's such a random choice. Like, the movie does have a little bit of magical realism in it, like the first one. Mm -hmm. Is there a connection to Raging Bull in this movie? Like, why choose to do that Raging Bull moment? Is it just I think a pop it's just culture? A com I think it's just, just a, a comedy thing. I think it's yeah. like... It's it's to me like freeze framing in the middle of action scenes. It's mm -hmm. just purely a stylistic choice of like, here's a here's a dash of comedy. Yeah, I mean the <laughs> the, the the connection we kind of were making was like they're both movies about people who are like shitty, yeah, <laughs> and right. yeah. they're like moralizing about those people in different unsympathetic. ways. Yes, well, yeah, Raging unsympathetic has that, protagonist that element of Lamada standing up on stage trying to like amuse people with the stories of his wild days. You <laughs> yeah, know, <laughs> truly, there, Which is, there are some parallels to the right, stories. Right, just being like, I got up to some girl bad in shit. the very beginning. Right. Um, I, I do think, you know, I was, I was asking Scott or not asking, but so bringing up how quickly you, you jumped. You ordered to, me. I ordered, I demanded, um, uh, no, that we, we asked if you had any bull thoughts and you, you pretty quickly threw out your love of this one. And it's like, I, I maybe knew three other people in the span of, uh, doing these episodes since they've been coming out who have messaged me as they've been listening and going like, have you watched T2 yet? Cause it's kind of great. And right. no one talks about it. And what I find fascinating is everyone I know who's seen this movie thinks it's really good and underrated. Right. And then outside of that, everyone I know who hasn't seen it either completely forgot it existed. Or they're like, well, there's no way that's good, right? Because if it was yeah. good, I would have right. heard about it. Didn't know it existed. Right. Or I have now heard from so many people listening to the show who think that this is a bit we've been doing for weeks. <laughs> that there's a transpiring sequel? Right, that we're just like, we make dumb bits where right, we're that like... Right, that we're going to be like, yeah, see you next week for, the, you know, the beach too hardly beaching right, or whatever. Like that's, yeah, right, right. Yeah. and then someone was like, oh, and it's called T2? Like, that's the joke yeah. you guys would make is comparing it to a different sequel yeah. title. Well, well that, I, I think that's why I went in with such low expectations. Yes. And why I was so pleasantly surprised. Um... It, it, yeah, it's it's weird. I I I sometimes feel like I'm the only person other than Jake Fogelness who's seen it. Well, so, and I think the thing of like 20 years of people being like, do it, do it, do right. it, mm -hmm. and then Zoolander two comes out, and everyone's like, pass. Yeah. I'm busy that day. Right. <laughs> right. That's a great. That's a great I, example of like right. a sequel that totally misses the mark for whatever reason. Yes. And you and and is it because they hew too closely to the original, or is it or is it because it doesn't feel Tonally like the original, I don't know. No, that movie, yeah, it's like you say, it's plagued by all the problems these legacy sequels yeah. often have where they're like, well, we, we have to pay homage to all of the stuff from the first movie, right. right? It's been too long. Yes. Everyone wants us to do that, right? And then they release that and then they've thrown in some new stuff and everyone's just like, why the fuck did you do this? I but, hate this. Like, like 20 years of any interview, Stiller, that's the Ferrell, thing, right. or Wilson does. Hey, go, so when's Zoolander 2 coming? Right. right. And it was just like, I guess people need us to make this fucking thing. Right. And then not only did it not work out, but also like it made so much less money than the first movie, which bombed at the time <laughs> coming out two weeks after 9-11. Right. Like no one even went to see it out of curiosity. And then this, you're like, how is this? Well, and I, and I saw it opening weekend and I... I, I couldn't quite tell while I was watching it because I, I, I was actively hating it. Right. And I was like, but I like the first one. It, have I changed? Has right. movie taste changed? Or I just think it, it wasn't done well. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, or fundamentally, like, sure. Right. It yeah. could have been done better. But I'm like, is this truly the only example of the like, quote unquote, legacy fan sequel. demanded yeah. decades later legacy sequel or revival of TV show or whatever that comes out Everyone basically ignores and is good. Yeah, right. I know. I mean, Possibly. yeah, ignored is the part that you can't really find. A yeah, comparison. because the, they're being good ones. Yes, there's probably, although we haven't seen it yet, the Before Sunrise trilogy right. that we've talked about. And like, and Maverick is good. Yeah, you know, but but this is one that people legitimately don't know about, and I think have. When they hear about it, they just go like, well, I could, that couldn't possibly be good. 2017? So, yeah, no way. <laughs> yeah, so why would I ever watch it? And then it does feel different. And so yes. I think if you do watch it, people could go like, well, it's too different. I don't like it. But but I, I when, when I think of Danny Boyle movies, and I don't know if you guys rank them at the end of your season or whatever, sure but do. for me, this is one of his like top 
three, I think. Oh, yeah. You know? It's top five I just, for me. Yeah. I'm it's, still, it's I'm just still so, working on my ranking. Yeah. It's so well done and so meaningful. Yeah. And I don't know whether you have to be my age to to truly... and it, to, Because it, the same thing happened when we were watching Before Sunrise, where I am the exact age of those characters, right? Yeah. And so I'm watching it now at a remove the same way Sprague watched the first one, where yeah. it's like, oh, shit, I could have been that guy. If I had watched this the year it came out, would I have been as pretentious as Ethan Hawke is in the, the movie? Would I have said, like, that's the way I want to act? Right. You know, whereas now I'm looking at it going, like, this guy's embarrassing, <laughs> you know? And and so it's, it's it's yeah, I don't know. It's very interesting. Yeah, look, I mean, we, we are uh, younger than you, Scott, a humble brag. Uh, but even just... <laughs> are you uh, using doing... that correctly? <laughs> I, I think it's pretty perfect. <laughs> Uh, we have, we have people who regularly write in and go, uh, uh, it's driving me crazy. Griffin doesn't understand the application of humble brag. Right. Uh, <laughs> when for me, the application it, it, it is, is a big pet peeve of mine Yes, because, because people have been using it incorrectly. So yes. for so long that now I think it's come, it's swung back around to now people are using it correctly because yes. people, people what w- were saying it when they just meant brag, right? Like they'd go like. Hey, I have a lot of money, humble brag. <laughs> and <laughs> and I would go, that's just bragging. But now I feel like it's a way to humble brag by saying humble brag. Right. Actually, right. So now brag. I feel like if you go, your own brag. Yeah, yeah, now I right. feel like if you go humble brag and make a joke about it, it's like it's it's like, hey, I'm not I am bragging, I'm but joking I'm, about I'm joking it. about it. Yeah. So right. it's, now it's become the way to humble brag about something. I, actual humble bragging is saying like, oh, I'm having such a headache with my taxes because of how much I donated to charity last year. Like that's yeah. like a humble brag. I yeah. am still or fighting that's, the that's good. That's more fight. brag planning, I I feel sure. like. Lo- you know, you know um, you're right. You're right. But but anyway, th- I mean we could we could discuss it for, for I, i'm fighting I, the fight for using it incorrectly that's my yeah. stance is i'm trying to be the last one out here only using it when it doesn't apply at all yeah. <laughs> uh it's it's the it's the torch i'm holding above my head but my my point was watching uh these we spending the last couple months living in boil headspace as the two of us have and watching these largely in chronological order it did hit me hard just being like oh and here we are like rounding the end of our Danny Boyle journey and how how much things have changed. We've been watching fucking 30 years of film culture, like, zoom by week by week and, and talking about these movies. And the only bummer is, like, I obviously want Danny Boyle to keep making movies. I would like him to make another film soon. It does feel like this would be the perfect end to our miniseries for where to leave him yeah, off. Right. Where you're like, perfect grace. Now, oh, next week I got to cover yesterday. Yeah, it is <laughs> odd that... <laughs> We're I mean, ending on yesterday. Yeah, I, maybe we should have done I, this miniseries three years ago. Right. <laughs> it's so funny because like directors just, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think, and that's maybe why Tarantino was saying he's retiring. Yeah, but it's right. like that's I'm trying to think argument. of any director who has a perfect final film. You know, it's it's just so hard to come by because it's usually you get to those like you know Billy Wilder. Right. What's his last movie? You know, Buddy uh, Buddy. Buddy, buddy. Usually, yeah. you they all they, everyone just has like two stinkers at the end of their career, you know, and it's just where they're basically like, yeah, I am bad at it. Okay, okay, right. I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Oh, I'll stop. I, bad I had to check. I, had to I, check. I, I stayed right. one movie too long. <laughs> right, right. Uh, it, it's not. I don't think it's one of his best movies, but I have always argued that Prairie Home Companion is a good final film. Like, it's a good, mm. like, final sort of thoughts. And Garrison Keller is a great guy. I, I think he's a perfect guy. <laughs> <laughs> that, because that movie is elegaic. Yeah. Like, sure. But it's also, like, the sort of... I don't put it anywhere near his... first right, best movie absolutely. that guy ever made. So. But I'm like, that's kind of a good final statement, even if it's not ending on a high note, you know? But yeah. you rarely get to plan that out. Usually when someone has a good final movie... Not to be morbid, it's because they died. Yeah. Yes. It's because Bizarrely their young. career was cut short well, yes. for some sad Usually reason. Usually to to incorporate the title of your show, you know, when when someone has a great movie, they get that blank check again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then and they, they and they make around. things like, you know, that that last Christopher Guest Netflix miniseries or yes. you know, I mean it just like Netflix is per- is a perfect example of people giving enormous blank checks to directors, myself included, mm. <laughs> and and uh, them fucking yeah, they you up. You myself like included. Two, <laughs> well, they paid you like two podcast guest appearances to direct that. I know, yeah, <laughs> well, it was crazy. The, the check itself they gave him was very was humongous, over- yeah. right. Right, 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 right. Netflix only has novelty size checks. 
No, but yes, he, I, Christopher Guest did an interview recently where he was like, I don't think I'm ever making a mockumentary ever again. I think it's sort of been overdone. And you go like, I wish you had realized that like three mockumentaries ago. (laughs) Sure. You know, can we talk about one other thing Mm -hmm. in this movie? No. And and it speaks to Scott. Okay, Scott says no. Uh, But it it speaks to sort of the final film of it all and like the meta narrative that's happening. I do like that the movie ends with Spud hitting him with a clean toilet. Mm. Yeah. The yeah. movie is hinged on a toilet. As yeah. the keep seeing starts, the allusions to the, like, you know, the, the shitty goes, toilet. He goes yeah. into the shitty toilet and goes, yeah. Ugh, I haven't seen one of those in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I keep th- like this movie does things where I'm like, oh, what an interesting like take on a sequel. But then they do the other thing where it's like, well, that's a fun little Easter egg for the first one. He hits him with a big toy. Yeah, and you end with replicating like the shot of the room stretching out from the first Mm -hmm. movie. Like they sort of start to play the hits and the remix of Lust for Life and whatever. You were talking about the way the like the soundtrack from the first movie kind of echoes Which around was, this film. Right, something that Boyle insisted on. He was like, if we're going to use any songs from the past soundtrack, yeah. they need to be remixed. They need to have a new flavor. But I also yeah. like they use Born Slippy almost the way the first Creed movie uses, uses Gonna Fly theme. Now, yeah, where it's yeah, like they yeah. tease you and they're like, is it going to play now? Right. Yeah, and you yeah. think <laughs> it's about to happen and then they sort of cut it short or they obscure it. And you're just waiting for like, when are you going to give me the full thing again? Yeah. Oh, man. But it's like, yeah, there's this kind of sad ending of him being like, I guess, like, okay, here, I this is where I want to be. I want to be with Sick Boy. These are my friends. But the other thing I've been running away from is like, I guess I just got to get to know my dad as a person. Yeah, he's mm-hmm. really sad. <laughs> really sad. I guess I got to just live <laughs> right. in this. Well, you know, you mentioned the you mentioned the soundtrack, and it's, it's so interesting because you, you there's this temptation to be like, well, this soundtrack is going to be of this moment. Mm. Right. Right. And how sad would that be if it's like a bunch of, right. you know, 45-year-olds going, hey, this this music Dancing is pretty cool. Charlie yeah, right? CX or whatever. <laughs> yeah, you know, instead instead they do really great allusions to like, oh, no, listening to music is like a young person's thing, mm-hmm. <laughs> you right. know. But then that There's having this, been said. This that, group Young Fathers. I was going to say the yeah. end credit song, which is so good, and I looked up and is from like, 2017 and is like a b-side single and i'm like where is he fucking pulling these oh he, i mean he likes music i, I, I know fundamentally throughout danny boyle's L- career do re mi fa so latino he loves that <laughs> you know he, and he's always trying to get that in and the studio so, always thank you him. thank you so much i wasn't gonna ask <laughs> but thank you for gracing us with that on the show of course, no, just, of course. Lex, lex g king of internet movie commenters would always just be like it's so funny to think about danny boyle in his mid-50s still right. being plugged in on all this Pumping stuff the ipod but it's it's impressive that it never feels that desperate or pathetic where you're like he is somehow still finding good shit i like the music he picked yeah but but how how embarrassing would it be if like you know ewan mcgregor's character you know rent boy is listening to billy eilish or whatever you know it's just like you know right no that would that would suck what you would yeah fear yes that's the old guy at the club where you're like why is this guy here right Right, yeah i think 30 percent of being a good director Mm. And this kind of is like a John Waters thing too. Of like thirty percent of being a good director is you gotta have good taste in music. Yes, like right. there mm. are so many directors where I'm like, oh, I un- I see your good taste in music yeah. making this movie better. And well, I think- that is, that is that that is the one thing about about my movie that the the the, the person who did the music was very complimentary to me. He was like, mm. you have such a really good ear because you know I had to plug in a lot of temp music. Yeah. And then work with him very late in the process of like, you know, this is what it's got to sound like and all that. And he was like, you have such an amazing, you know, it is something that I think helps when you're trying to evoke a feeling from from a movie. And that's why what is so fascinating about this movie to me is that so much of it has no music. Yes. And it's and it's so quiet. They're and you depriving hear, like, you. Like, yeah. s- bird nature sounds <laughs> for, throughout a lot of it. Or if know? there's music, you find that it's diegetic in a certain yeah. way. Like it's on right. someone's headphones or the jukebox or something. Yeah. I mean, Scott, last time you were on the show was uh, Something Wild in our Jonathan Demi miniseries. And that's similarly a movie where you watch it and you're like, God, Jonathan Demi's cool. This guy's cool. Like yeah, every time there's a, a music choice in that movie, you're like, what a cool fucking dude. There's, I want to go to There's not only a music it. choice, but a choice of like, where to set a scene or yeah. where to what where what to dress background artists to put yeah. in the scene yeah. and you know yeah just his taste level is so exemplary yes and Bo- Boyle generally has that even his movies that kind of like swing and miss I'm like he does seem like a cool guy I think he's a fun yeah even guy. Slumdog there's some like freaking bangers in there right what, yeah. what's yeah. it Jaiho Paper oh, yeah, Planes Paper Planes well you have yeah. Paper Planes and yeah but yeah Jaiho shout out 
But yeah, I, I think, you know, going back to this thing, the, the how, how does this movie have no reputation, right? I think yeah. what's weird about it is, like, we can list so many examples of the things like Zoolander 2 where it's like they went back to the well one too many times, they overstayed, it's depressing now or whatever, that it feels like any time this works, it feels like such a magic trick that it mm-hmm. either becomes, like, a hit, even a bigger hit than expected, or at sure. least, like, in a before sunset sunrise way is, like, so lauded by critics as, like, you know what, on paper, bad idea, but it fucking worked. Right. That it's weird that this one works, and I do not know, like, you're making the point, Scott, of, like, I could see someone being disappointed that's not fun like the first movie. I don't know anyone who has that complaint. It's, like, I only know people who like it or haven't seen it. Yeah, uh, that's the thing is, uh, yeah. is I also feel like the movie business essentially is not the same in 2017 as it was in 1996, where no. you don't have a lot of people getting this hyped to see an indie film like no. this. Um, you know, I, I, I think it, I think it's a lot of people my age who are nostalgic for the 90s when it was like, what indie film is coming out this week? You know? Yeah. Um, I, like I said, I saw it at the Arclight and I think, you know, the Avengers was playing, you know, probably across right. the theater, you know, it's just like not the same, not the same as it was. Well, we should play the box office mm-hmm. game, but, um, I mean, I will note I mean, this, this film did do very well in Britain. Okay. Uh, it made like of 17, course, of course. 17 we, million we pounds that. there. Yes. Yeah. Me and David um, know, of course. Which is like, so, you know, it, I think I, there may have just been an, an, a, a sort of a quick realization from Sony who mm-hmm. distributed it like like oh we're we're getting no pulse out of America this, was, this is a European play they, they kind of right? went like, too big too quickly and then just abandoned yes yeah uh, the film came out March okay. 17th okay 2017 2017 okay uh, so we're very early into the Trump administration uh-huh. so everyone's you know feeling things great good yeah. right um, the vibe are, is just fucking hitting yeah. things are starting to it get just great hits again different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's opening number 29. <laughs> okay. Uh, on how many uh, screens? On five screens. Okay. Uh, to a okay $34,000 per screen average. And then did they maybe. go like a thousand screens the next week? It never got that far. Okay. It, 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 it's, it's, it's biggest, uh, it was at three, 330 screens. Wow. And then they just kind of dropped and it. And what does it top out at? Two point three million dollars. Mm, less again than half a black hat. But in, in internationally, it made forty. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it made twice its budget. Uh, That's our ultimate me- metric: is how many black hats a flop. And makes. it only yeah. made it probably only made money because all the actors were like, "We won't take. We don't need any money for this." Like, yeah, they famously took no money for this, right? Like they. Uh, yeah, no, they were all paid the exact same amount of money. The four stars were paid <laughs> equal mm-hmm. scale, essentially. Yeah. Um, number one at the box office this week, Griffin mm-hmm. is making. I would say roughly about. Um, oh, I'm, God, I'm so bad at math. Uh, you know, about eighty five times okay. what Train Spotting made in its total run. Okay. Train Spotting two. So it's a so huge an opening weekend movie. Yes, it's opening to one hundred seventy four million dollars in twenty it's a family film. Seventeen. It's a family film. Is it Beauty and the Beast? Disney's Beauty and the Beast. With Emma mm. uh, another movie that is completely memory hold, as forgotten as T two Train Spotting, yeah, except it made a billion dollars. I am at the wondering time. if there's a Trump thing here. If we were all in such a goddamn daze at yeah. the beginning of that year, they're like Beauty and the Beast comes out and we see it, and we're like, yeah, sure, I guess that happened to me. I don't know. Right. I can't really think about too much. Well, Beauty and the Beast. I, I mean, I I saw that of course at the Santa Rabba Dome, of course, opening weekend, but um. I don't remember that being a like having any sort of Trump stink on it. I just remember seeing it and everyone in the theater being sort of like, huh. He's saying we had Trump stink on us. Yeah, I'm not saying like oh, people, okay. It was just like we were all in a bit of a daze. Like yeah. we just you don't know, remember no, any I, of this but, shit. But, but I guess I I I I don't, I don't remember my point of view sure. being like I was I, I, in fact, if you had said like, did that come out when Trump was president? I I wouldn't have been able to put that together. I, I, I just, just assume all four of us were still feeling pretty guilty for voting for him. I mean, this is well, only like four was, or five months I, I later. I made a mistake. No, at this point, I had, I had no. At this, at this point, you know. <laughs> it was starting Scott to pay thinks out. he's been proven right. Yeah, yeah I, 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 remember, I pretty much was still with him up till about January 19th of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> I think the day he got elected, if I remember correctly. He just didn't fight hard enough. I, I think right. if I remember correctly, I was in a writer's it. room and we all got really sad, and I believe we went to go see the movie The Accountant. Mm. <laughs> and if you asked me, if you were to ask me one detail about it, I couldn't tell you. Other yeah. than that, I think it's a problematic movie. <laughs> but 
Yeah. This is the Ben Affleck? Yeah. 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 Yes. Ben mm-hmm. Affleck is an accountant. He's so OCD, it makes him the greatest killer in the world. <laughs> right? Isn't that <laughs> the premise of the movie? Essentially <laughs> correct. Yeah. Correct. Yes. He's really OCD. He's really about good at bullets. being a mob accountant and also shooting. People. Ending up in the right place. <laughs> um, Speaking of which, I, I've been watching The Bachelor, mm. and they keep having ads for the good doctor and they make me laugh every single so, time I see them. I don't know what to think. It's the about guy who that. played Norman Bates and yes. he's going, well, I do believe we need to have a baby now. <laughs> it's like, I, I'm like going, this is a fucking show. It's, what, and what it seems to be doing well. Oh, huge, it's a huge, huge hit. hit. What if we uh, took the cancer out? <laughs> I want to operate on you. Damn, this doctor's good. Bobby, <laughs> I'll sell propane. Number two uh-huh. at the box office. Sure. Was number one the week before. Okay. Um, sort of a, it's like a quasi remake, quasi sequel. Quasi remake, quasi sequel. It's part. Flatliners? No. Uh, it's, that was a good guess. I <laughs> suppose. Because they brought Kevin Bacon back. You realize it's not a remake. It's like a continuum thing. Or maybe they brought Kiefer back. They didn't bring Bacon back. They brought Kiefer back. Did they? I think. Okay. No, it's, it's a big hit. Uh, okay. A reasonably sized hit. Uh, it's part of a verse. It's part of a verse. It was number one the week before. Hmm. A big epic action movie. What studio? Uh, the good people at Warner Brothers. The good people at Warner Brothers. It's the part Brothers of Warner. Mm-hmm. It's part the of Brothers a verse. Warner. Are, 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 uh, Kong Skull Island. It's Kong colon Skull Island. Sure. Sure. Ooh. Brie Larson, Tom Hiddleston, Samuel L. Jackson. John C. Riley. Samuel Jackson, famously. Eugene, Eugene Cordero. Cordero. Hey, we got there. Uh, we got yeah. him. Uh, and it's just one of those movies where it didn't even actually do that well. No. It 168 domestic. Yeah. But Warner Brothers was kind of just like, ah, full speed ahead, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. He's got to fight Godzilla. Yes. Like, who cares if people didn't even really like That's it? It's so weird that this was in March because in that summer I was at Comic-Con and... Uh, the director was still doing press. And I remember like I, I was part of this really weird Rotten Tomatoes program and I ended mm-hmm. up having to apologize to him oh, like that I was a part of it because <laughs> I, I was like, I was just the host. This was not my deal at a party <laughs> later. So like it felt like Kong Skull Island had way more juice than Disney's Beauty and the Beast. But if, I think that it was also them being like, he's going to fight Godzilla. You're in on this. You know, Is it this, was yeah. like less about people it, like loving that movie and more about the like, can we please commit to this? Can we all Is this the director who's this? supposed to make the Metal Gear Solid movie? Correct. Yes, although yeah, that's I need just someone seems... to make the fucking movie. I'd like someone to make it. I'd like someone to Maybe make it. Maybe not that guy. If with yeah. Oscar Isaac, I think it would be fucking fantastic. I've seen yeah. some, there's like storyboards and stuff for it that I, look I, great. I but... believe that is the plan. Yes. I believe that film is in pre-production. Yes. And it's maybe been in it'll pre-production happen. for a bit. It sure has. <laughs> a long time. Uh and uh yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh n- number 3 is a, a genuine hit. Okay. Also part of a verse, I okay. suppose. Uh You suppose it's part well, of Well, it's a very long-running verse. Um A very long-running verse. Something verse. Yeah. Um but this film mm. is R-rated. Ooh, it's a long-running verse. Is it a horror franchise? No. No. It's, it's unusual for a film to be mm. R-rated. In this series? In this series. Interesting. Is it Logan? It's Logan. Good call. Now, Good call. There's a little Did I just scoop Griffin in the you box sure office hold game? On, hold on, though. But, but David's going to tell you something. Spring, that's going to blow a, your fucking a mind. Little, a little secret about a that movie. A little secret. It's okay, actually it's quietly a Western. It's a Western. If you, if what? you think about it. No, when I Holy think shit. you okay, see no, Wolverine, you think, oh, yellow spandex, a superhero. Yeah, yeah, but it's actually a Western? <laughs> kind of a Western. I look up, I see now, no you can long tell. brimmed hat upon his head. There's some subtle hints in the movie, such as characters keep watching the movie Shane and being <laughs> like, yeah, this is familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all I think about when I talk, think about that movie is the guy going, the Wolverine. <laughs> no, that's um, it. I, I've only seen it once. Yeah, same here. It's, it was like oh, an Oscar Logan? nominated huge hit. Yeah. And I, I liked it when I Logan. saw it. Logan. Do you yeah, love Logan I, I, I watched the black and white version uh-huh. oh, not yeah, that's right. too long ago. And uh, I, th- I think it's, it's it, fun. It's really good. It it's maybe gets slightly comic booky in the last 20 minutes. But other right. than that, it, it the is the showdown. most like realistic of all X-Men films. See, Sims and I are both big defenders of the Wolverine. I do like the Wolverine. I That's like that until love. Act 3, and it just totally falls apart. You, that you didn't enjoy Silver book. Samurai. Yes, right. yes, yes. I mean, that is, it's a tough needle to thread. That's the one I like. I'm a yeah. fan of that movie. Um, maybe we'll do the Wolverines. That, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of fun. 
Actually, Scott hasn't seen uh, X Men Origins Wolverine. Oof. Oh, Ooh, that's, that's the one that is that a tough seen. one. Yeah, but that's like a that's fun, a real cup of vinegar. Because we do we do film series on Patreon, and we can never do X Men because it's seventy five percent directed by different sexual predators. <laughs> <laughs> but we could just do the three Wolverines. Wait, yeah. you got you got uh, Brian Singer, and wait, who's the other? Brett Ratner. Oh, oh yeah, All yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Number number four at the box office, Griffin. Okay, is a surprise horror hit. Mm. Horror hit. Okay, uh, that has been out for a month. It's made one hundred and thirty three million dollars. Wow! And it's a uh, quiet place. It's not the a quiet place. Huh. But a it's, big hit. It's a directorial debut. Is it the Babadook? No, nope. <laughs> Babadook did not make that much money. Uh, is it the Is it the Vavitch? It's not the Vavitch. One hundred and thirty. How many weeks has it been out? Four. Four and directorial debut. Yes, it's a very it's screamingly obvious what this is, and you're gonna be annoyed at yourself. I'm gonna be so fucking oh, oh here's it's another get clue. Out. It won an Academy it's get Award. Out. It's get, yes. it's it's get, get, out. get out. out. It's get out. It's get out. Uh which you know not only opened really well, but then had such great word of mouth that it, you know, barely dropped. It had like a one percent drop yes. in its second weekend. Um yeah. so uh get out, obviously wow. a big one there. Wow. Now, number five. Oof, okay. America said, let's get in to the theater. They did say that. And see now, that again. Number five is, uh, the, the title the of this the movie, film is... They were like, let's get out of this theater. <laughs> right, because right, they need to so, clean it. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Someone said to them at a certain point as yeah. well, like, can you please get out? The next film is a faith-based okay. uh, film, I is think. It, Heaven is for real. It's not Heaven I is for real, I always want Burpo. it to be Burpo. You always want it to be Burpo. Is it, uh, fuck. Is it, is it the Jennifer Garner one? No, I think it's not quite as directly like uh, okay. one of those. It's things. not the shack. It is. It the is shack. the shack. Uh, do you guys the remember shack. the shack? You mean Kazam. <laughs> <laughs> Steel. No, I would Steel? call him the Great Shack. Uh, uh, no, uh, it's uh, you know Sam Worthington, Octavia Spencer, Tim McGraw. Yes, Jake Sully himself. Uh, Tim McGraw is in it as well. Yes, right. Rada Mitchell looks like is in this. That's cast. like a magical shack that lets you atone for your sins or some. I couldn't tell you. I know I it's believe- magical. So like Jacob in Lost? I think so. He lived in a magic shack. Yeah. Too. Okay, so if you believe in the Bible already, mm-hmm. why are we adding magic to it? <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> well, we may be like, using the word magic somewhat blasphemously here. Well, I mean, it, you know, it's like miracles and stuff like that are already yeah. kind of magic. Right. But it's like, you don't... It's a hat on a hat here. Yes. You don't need to be like, oh, also there's a magical house. There's a magical shack, uh, and uh, I'm looking up what the exact premise of the shack is. David, you brought up Lost. Before we end this episode, I want to ask you guys a Lost question, please. I just mm. let's table Wait, that. For you a think they're about to end the episode? Oh, I don't know when <laughs> they got. We're definitely about before they end the episode. <laughs> I just want the, some of the other films in the top ten, Lego Batman, which uh, uh, I think masterpiece, we're both big fans yes. of. Yes, uh, new this week is the Belco experiment. Remember that? Oh, they, it was like the James Office, Gunn. but they murder each other. Yeah, James Gunn wrote that and produced that. Uh, yeah. Uh, he sure wrote it. Yes. Uh, and uh, you also have Hidden Figures, uh, Mm -hmm. sort of holdover from Oscar season. You've got John Wick Chapter Mm -hmm. 2. Now he's up to Chapter 4. I don't know if you know this. Uh, and something called Before I Fall. That's That's, the Haley Lou Richardson? Is that a time loop movie or a time travel? Zoe Zoe Deutsch? Uh, Zoe Deutsch. There you go. the, The IMDb just one sentence synopsis for The Shack is... A grieving man receives a mysterious personal invitation to meet with God oh. at a place called the shack. So the shack is apparently where God hangs out. Where God hangs out. But well, wait, the it, God shack <laughs> is a little old place where God goes and hangs out there. With Jake Saul. Scott, yeah. Scott pulled I'll, out a script for that. He had been writing that for a while. Yeah. Thank you it's so also much. The for... same, it's also the same premise as that TV show, God Friended Me, right? Yes. The, the show where God is friending people on Facebook. Right. Well, in something. that case, right. The shack was, was online. It was not a physical <laughs> shack. It's a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah, this fun little shack I like to hang out at called Facebook. Um, yeah. What's yeah. your last question? Spread? Okay, so mm. I believe that Lost is a piece of IP that is, it's interesting, it ended so poorly in the eyes of the people who watched it. Of the Beholder. Mm. Of the Beholder. I, that mean, I mostly it, enjoyed the ending, but yes. It yeah. has a weird sort of reputation now, but I know for sure that ABC has been open to any sort of reboot. Right. Does someone have a pitch? Mm -hmm. Does someone have a pitch? 
and it got me thinking because I was like, "This is what if they weren't lost? What if they were found? They, they were like, hey, I know where I am. <laughs> but, I know exactly where I, I'm dropping a pin. And then I'm sharing the, location the, with then friends. You got the horn blare, and you know the, the camera goes in on them. <laughs> if they made lost. lost now, you know that like the first ten minutes would be people going like, I can't live without my tweets. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Oh my god, the algorithm isn't working. Yeah, I, I guess you're I want to see the question. movie about I, but, that guy. Uh, wait I just a think second. it's. It's such an interesting show that's already about like people's past and the future and all of sure. it making sense. So to be making a sequel about Lost, like there has to be a take that like is going to encapsulate some of that. Sure. And I'm always thinking like, what's the type of thing they would make? Is it people like? Is it the version of it where they're just recapturing what worked in the first one? Playing crashes on another island, they're just doing it again. L2 or would lost. you need to come at it from another angle? Would you need the old characters from the old show? Well, or right, or or do they? Does someone pitch something really arcane? Like, right. it's a Dharma Initiative show. Yeah, like we we go all in on lore. Like we we get even more niche. Because that's the thing. I think there is this sort of uh, there's this sort of false perception that people's problem is with the finale of Lost, and I think they make mm -hmm. jokes about we all remember the finale of Lost as like shorthand, but it's like. No, you're like the finale was when people realized, oh, all this shit isn't going to get answered. Sure. Yeah, I think people yeah, have yeah. less of an issue with that episode itself and more with the like, oh, maybe the last two seasons weren't what I wanted. Well, the fifth season's incredible. I think people have a problem with the final season of Lost. Yes. I mean, Scott, yes. you were a Lost Super fan, right? I think we were both yeah. big Lost fans. Like, I, like I really Lost. like, I even like the last season. I look, I don't yes. think it's perfect, of course, but mm. I, I always think about like hey, your this. accent's back. My accent just <laughs> clicked back. I said, Scott. <laughs> Cool. But I think to myself, I think to myself, like, is what the, a wonderful world. <laughs> is a version of this, is a version of the lost thing, like, you have to find a whole new story and then find a way to connect it to the lost I think universe? The, the only reason right. it was popular, is, uh, or as popular as the, like, not wish fulfillment, but the, like, modern people having to survive on a desert right. island. So if you strip right. it of that and make it the... Dharma initiative or whatever, then you're getting way too into the lore and the all lore stuff and, and, so, and and so I think I think for a take to be really be successful, you would need to do that part of it and then try to make the mythology of it make more sense. Right. right. I'm yeah, sure right. that's part of the assignment is you need to start answering some shit, but also what, what was the answer going to be? I, I, I'm with magic. you. I, I, I I've talked about this before. It should have been something scientific, and those guys wanted to do something that was sort more spiritual. theology based. Right. Um, right, right, right. They set up so many things of like pushing a button that were tech based and like yeah. a polar bear you move the wheel and then the yeah, wheel. toes on the statue. That, that suddenly for them to go like Oh no no no! It's all magic. It's the light. Right. <laughs> if it is like people going like, ah, okay, but you'll tell us at the finale, right? <laughs> right. But I actually like it because at a certain extent, like Thor said, of course, some people call it technology, some people call it magic. But on on uh, what was the primitive they civilization? No, where are they, they from? Asgard. 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 In Asgard, they're one in the same. Yeah, yeah. he so said I, that in law. He, if he had said that during an ep loss of episode, yeah, that yeah suddenly Thor good. flies down. Right. Oh, he's like, also, look, magic, uh, technology. Also, what a wonderful world voice. One more last thing I need to bring up: the song that is in Train Spotting, mm. where it's like their reflection song, where it's like, dun, dun. that's that's the underworld song, the dun 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 dun. Yeah. Dun dun dun. dun now dun, is dun, that dun, dun. sampled in Future Islands? Uh, season song Sprague? Oh, because Sprague? every time it came I up I was like this Future Island song is going to start playing exact same Obviously. thought that is one of my most listened to songs I've they, listened to Berlin Slippy a number of times they sound similar I only this time watching T2 picked up on how similar the, the openings are but I think I, it's, I, I think it's true. True. <laughs> That's, uh, the voice reminded me but but it really is interesting. I will yeah. say this: someone once asked uh, the lead singer of Underworld, who I believe his name is Carl Hyde, mm -hmm. that question. Okay, being essentially like, oh, "Are you aware of this song, Seasons?" It kind of yeah. sounds like Born Slippy, and he was like, "It was intentional. I appreciate it. If yeah. it's a coincidence, that's nice. I wish them all the best." Right. And then they oh, asked, "That's nice." Yeah. They asked the Future Islands guy, and his response was, "People <laughs> change." <laughs> love that guy. To be clear, we love him. one of the greats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that song, by the way, "Born Slippy," I think is it's incredible. It's incredible, and it is like as groundbreaking as New Order's "Blue Monday." I think it was. I agree. You know, that's a good it, argument. It, it's also as speaking as a Brit and talk speaking of nostalgia, and I believe I said this on the Train Spotting episode. It is the number one 
needle drop in a club full of 30 something sure where when it comes on everyone is like oh and like right. runs to the dance i'm floor. like what even is that for american i like don't the know the fucking rugrats theme or some <laughs> shit the whisper song <laughs> the whispers <laughs> like it is just Wait, the sort of universal yeah. like oh we all have had like our time sure. with this song yes and i was a hit me baby one more time sure you know it's it yeah, probably maybe. it's also funny david because bong, when gong, I he- even when i hear the song for the first time i'm like <laughs> i feel like i've had time with this song even though i'm yeah. hearing it for the first time it has that instant <sighs> sort of feeling of nostalgia to it which is pretty well wild. it also is just like this 10 minute banger they don't even play all of it in the movie yeah, yeah, it's just well. like where it gets like super heavy it just felt like oh my god no one's ever done this before in the same way that the first time i heard blue monday with a dum 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 i thought it was kind of a joke or something right. mm. <laughs> and i sort of laughed at it but uh yeah i don't know i i love that song so much uh guys well, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really oh, appreciate thank it. You. Uh, thank pleasure. you. Everyone should listen to Scott Hasn't Seen. Right. Our episodes yes. first. Yes. Griffin yes. and I. But then and then the other ones. I did Griffin, Princess you Diaries. Did Princess Diaries. And Kindergarten yes. Cop. You did Kindergarten Cop, then Princess Diaries, and yeah. then David, you just did Gigi with I, us. I did Gigi. I, I and I'd love to return anytime, of course. Yes, please come yeah. back. Next uh, time you have like a movie with like uh, creepy pedo vibes. Have David on again. <laughs> I was just trying to finish my best picture list. It's right? weird that that was your first choice, David. By the way, David, do you like how he sort of sold you out of uh, in the intro before you were able to rebut? I was like, well, this guy picked this movie. Apparently, he must like the content in it or something. I haven't seen it before. <laughs> but I had to cop to the fact that I, I, I knew this movie was weird. Like Everyone sure. talks about yeah, Gigi's like, weird sh- movie. Yeah. yeah, that's the first thing they ever said about uh, it. Weird, but, but obviously, beyond just... Scott hasn't seen, which people should listen to. Uh, Scott, the comedy bang bang book. Yes, that's about what I out. really. I think it's out. Want to promote? Thank you for it's. It's out. Uh, I don't know what day this comes out. This but, uh, episode it's is out posting t- on April twenty third, the day before my birthday. Okay, so it comes mm-hmm. out in a couple of days. Okay. Comes out on Tuesday, April twenty fifth. And the day after. Um, if you if you don't know what comedy bang bang is, it's it's essentially this podcast I do where I'm myself and then. Uh, Sprague is himself occasionally, mm, but then we have comedians on playing characters. Show where you right. talk. Uh, unlike Sprague. Yes. Not unlike like me. No, yeah, no, no. Right. I come on. I'm pretty true to myself. I <laughs> yes. try to keep it cool. I'm British. <laughs> Just vibes. Um, and so the book is essentially what if all of those characters wrote stuff for a book. Mm-hmm. And so it's a collection of, I have I have the book right here in front of me. It's wow. a collection. Humble brag. It's a collection of like, it's not really humble. Okay. <laughs> it's a collection of uh, uh, like, you know, text pieces and lists and posters and flyers and games and, and strange ephemera uh, that I think uh, fans of the show will really enjoy. But I think if you're not a fan of the show, it's just a book packed with comedy. I also, yeah, I, as a as a guest and a fan mm. of the show, I think this book, it is over a decade's worth of comedy history on this podcast. And I mm. think there's there's stuff from really early on in the show. There's stuff from very recent in the show. So I think if you're a fan of Comedy Bang Bang or you want to get into it, I think this is a great book to get. Hey, and, that's great. Um, it's really quality. I'm very, I'm very, very excited to I'm, I'm it. excited a longtime well. listener and fan. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure David, didn't you introduce or uh, uh, interview me rather in a in the Ace Hotel? I sure uh, did years ago, like for season one of the TV show, right? It was for it was right after season one of the TV show, I believe. Yeah, yeah, right. Yes, I think we just fun. started doing the podcast, and you came back, and we we're like, I just interviewed Scott Ackerman mm-hmm. in a hotel. Oh, mm-hmm. Hey, David, who's your favorite sort of character on the? Who, who's your Ooh, guy? Great like, question. Oh, wait a who's second. your? Favorite, I don't want to make anyone upset. You know, I don't want to play favorite. Well, I mean, you could make someone really happy right now. <laughs> Well, you're you're not a character. Though. No, no, but I just know, you know, my client Sean Distant, yeah. of course, he's come right. on. I'd say Rudy North, maybe. Yeah, that that's guy. Right. Okay. That guy's really funny. Yeah. Hey, you Rudy know what? wrote something for the book. Yes, yes, yes. Spe- speaking of, speaking of, I have something I want to plug. Mm. Sprague, your client Sean Distant. I try to plug yes. this once a year if I can, mm-hmm. as the greatest acting reel in history. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank I always yes. plug this, and I went onto the YouTube recently because I watch it about once or twice a year. And I've mm-hmm. seen that, like, there are comments spread out by a year of Griffin sent me here. 
And we all appreciate it. My my <laughs> client, of course, he loves it. He's not booking anything from it, but <laughs> this he is why loves I'm telling people, people watch it. Watch it. Watch so it. Do, do reels it. work at all? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I thought. I think he thought. Oh, let me do something interesting. It and is maybe interesting. That'll hit. And yeah. it, 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 I don't okay. want to spoil it for anyone. It's the greatest acting reel of all time. Sean Dist, incredibly funny well, thank guy. Thank you so much. We'd thank love you so to much. have I'll him on the podcast sometime. Yeah, but you know, whatever. He's never busy. been able to pin him down. He's a tough one to book. Yeah, thought we had him once, and then someone else showed up. <laughs> ah yes of course yes. Scott <laughs> thank you all for listening please remember to rate review and subscribe thank you to Marie Barty for our social media helping to produce the show Lee Montgomery and the Great American Novel for our theme song AJ McKeon Alex Barron for our editing Joe Bowen Pat Rounds for our artwork JJ Birch for our research you can go to blankcheckpod.com for links to some real nerdy shit including our Patreon blank check special features where we do film series commentaries, as we're saying, and we're now doing the Planet of the Apes. Uh, I think we are, yeah, that's right. We're going absolutely. ape yes. in yeah, April. We've just begun the apes. Yes. Uh, one of my favorites. Tune in next week for the final Danny Boyle movie. Yesterday. Next week, All yesterday. My troubles. Yes. So far away. Yes. Uh, and yes. as okay. always, justice for Spud's dick. Yeah. <laughs> As always. You say that every episode? I say it every, every weekend it for the first time. It finally made sense after the first trade spot. It's relevant now. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's why Zach Braff is our best living filmmaker. 